This is Dan Schneider on this Dan Schneider video interview. I'll be talking with two experts on the life and career of American poet Hart Crane, and we will begin in a moment. Chaplinesque by Hart Crane We will make our meek adjustments, contented with such random consolations as the wind deposits and slithered in two ample pockets, for we can still love the world who find a famished kitten on the step and know recesses for it from the fury of the street or warm, torn elbow curverts. We will sidestep into the final smirk daily the doom of that inevitable thumb that slowly chafes its puckered index toward us, facing the dull squint with what innocence and what surprise. And yet these fine collapses are not lies more than the pirouettes of any pliant cane. Our obsequies are, in a way, no enterprise. We can evade you, and all else but the heart. What blame to us if the heart live on? The game enforces smirks, but we have seen moon in lonely alleys make a grail of laughter of an empty ash can, and through all sound of gaiety and quest, have heard a kitten in the wilderness. This is a first uh, on one of my interviews. It's probably the first show that I plan to do on major poets of the world. In the future, I plan to do things on uh, Walt Whitman, Wallace Stevens, Raina Maria Rilke, uh, some Chinese poets, perhaps, and, and so forth. But the first one that I am going to touch upon is Hart Crane, born Harold Hart Crane. And on the left, you'll see Neil Monroe. He founded a society called the Hart Crane Society a couple of years ago, and we'll talk with him in a moment about that. And on the right, you'll see Langdon Hammer, uh, Lanny, and we'll uh, talk with him in a moment. As I do with each of these shows, I like to give the guests a few minutes to talk about who they are, where they come from, what their association with the topic is. So let me start with you, Neil Monroe. Uh, you started the Hart Crane Society. If you could give a, a little biographical background, how you got into poetry, how you got into Crane's poetry, and how you eventually formed the society. Okay, sure. So, uh, yeah, I'm Neil Monroe. I'm uh, a senior lecturer uh, at Oxford Brookes University in Oxford in the UK, um, and I'm also a director of the Poetry Centre there, which does a lot of work in um, kind of bringing poets to Oxford and a lot of outreach work, as well as research into all kinds of poetry. Um, I started looking at uh, Crane during my undergraduate uh, career, um, and then I did work on him uh, as part of a master's, um, and then I did a PhD on Crane. Uh, and then I subsequently, in last year, published a book on Crane called uh, Hart Crane's Queer Modernist Aesthetic, uh, which was published by Palgrave Macmillan. Um, around sort of, yeah, a couple of years ago, um, uh, I was contacted by uh, a couple of people who were interested in founding a Hart Crane Society. Um, and we began that at the American Literature Association uh, two years ago um, and uh, in Washington and decided to continue that work. What we do basically is to try and promote the work of Crane, um, particularly since Crane is sometimes regarded as a very uh, sort of obscure, difficult writer. Uh, we try and, uh, as best we can, tackle some of that. Um, and also to have each year the ALA uh, a panel which looks at different aspects of Crane's work. What uh, first drew you to Crane's work? Was, was it his use of language? Was it his subject matter? I did, early on, I did, uh, at undergraduate level, I did a lot of uh, work on, the, on his lyrics uh, from White Buildings, um, but I only saw little bits of The Bridge, his, his long poem from 1930. Um, but that was the thing that really attracted me to him. Um, I had to go out then, find the whole poem, uh, and read it uh, cover to cover, uh, because I found it pretty remarkable in, in the way that it dealt, certainly with language, uh, but also just with ideas of America, uh, what America represented for him, uh, what it could be as far as he understood it to be in the future, and also his kind of relationship with, with other writers um, and visual artists, photographers uh, in New York in the 20s and 30s, uh, particularly with people, um, transatlantically, people like T.S. Eliot, who had this, this extraordinary back and forth with during the course of his career. Uh, okay, Lanny, how about you? Uh, let's talk a little bit about your background, how you got uh, into poetry in general, and uh, the poetry of Crane in particular, and any works you may have written about him. Thanks, Dan. Well, you know, as uh, Neil was talking, I was thinking, so how did I get involved in our Crane? And um, I uh, am recalling that as a teenager, I was very interested in poetry. And... I had 
had a little anthology, modern library anthology, edited by Conrad Aiken, uh, that, gosh, I, you know, what, what probably was edited in maybe the 50s, um, maybe earlier. Um, and it had Crane in it. Uh, and I read him, and it was really strange and, and, and uh, kind of mind expanding and, and electric to uh, to read this poet, including uh, swaths of the bridge as long poem. And I agree with uh, Neil that, you know, although I, you know, we, he and I have different relations to America, me being an American uh, and growing up here, uh, but there's a way in which Crane made a sort of idea of America as well as a kind of experience of American places uh, and atmospheres and weather uh, and urban spaces um, available and, and uh, in, in this kind of gorgeous, electric, strange poetry. And, and uh, I was really, really taken by it um, as a young person. And then, um, I don't know, uh, what prowling around a um, used bookstore in New Haven, where I was a student and then became a professor, where I am now at Yale, I, uh, I remember finding um, a paperback edition of Crane's Letters, uh, edited by Brom Weber, an old, and it must be said, pretty junky edition, um, although, you know, God bless Brom Weber for, for putting it together. Um, and um, that, uh, I love that book. Uh, it was, you know, it was a kind of revealing, powerful book about Crane's life uh, that was intimate and uh, uh, intimate and, and compelling. And, um, and when I, I carried that book around, I thought it was really special. Nobody taught Hard Crane, and I thought, well, I have this really cool thing. Uh, and uh, turned out my teachers thought he was pretty cool too. I, I later learned, um, and uh, but 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 Crane was a, a, a um, unusual and eccentric taste uh, then and now. I, I think it's fair to say uh, he's kind of um, uh, what would you want, want to say? Sort of um, he, he continually lures and defeats efforts to uh, uh, make him easily available. <laughs> Just put it that way. Or to place him even. Although I guess we'll try to do that today since uh, Neil and I are both uh, well equipped to do that. Um, I, uh, I, so hard pain was important to me. I, I wrote a, a, a PhD dissertation at, at Yale that was uh, uh, the first chapter was supposed to be about Crane, and whoop, the whole thing turned out to be about Crane and actually his friend Alan Tate and their relationship. Uh -huh. uh, and then uh, later, that, that book got published um, uh, called Hard Crane and Alan Tate, Janice Faced Modernism. And um, a few years later, I put together a, a, um, a new edition of Crane's Selected Letters that was sort of enlarged and and gave full texts of the letters uh, as opposed to what Ron Weber had done um, and, and set it in a biographical narrative uh, in a book called uh, Oh My Land, My, My Friends, The Selected Letters of Hart Crane. And then, and then finally, I, I, I uh, worked on the uh, Library of America edition of Crane's Letters and, and Poems. So um, I ended up spending a lot of, a lot of my life on, on Hart Crane or with Hart Crane. And, and, uh, it's been, uh, it's been rewarding. So was that the complete poems and selected letters and prose of Hart Crane to Ankle Literary Library? Uh, that's another book. Okay. Uh, let's see. I mean, there have been a number of editions of Crane over yeah. the years. Because that uh, one... Just so people know, one of the reasons I wanted to do this was not only because Crane was a great poet, and I would argue probably, I think, the greatest published American poet of the 20th century, but he's probably the most mis misunderstood basically because most of the, the people who wrote about him were either homophobes or just plain idiots. And, uh, for example, I, 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 I'm looking, I've got two, I, I've got a number of my crane, own crane books. I know my wife has a few yeah. others. For example, I have Voyager, Life of Heart Crane, John Unterake's bio, which is actually yeah. pretty good. 
The Broken Tower, The Life of Heart Crane by Paul Mariani. But then I just want to read off a couple of the more noxious uh, yeah. critical books that I've, I've got here. I'm not going to, we're not going to go too deeply into them. But uh, for example, most of them are from the 60s through 80s. There's Heart Crane, The Patterns of His Poetry by M.D. Uroff. Then there's Heart Crane in the Homosexual Text, New Thresholds, New Anatomies by Thomas E. Vingling. Then we have Heart's Bridge by Sherman Paul. Heart Crane, An Introduction to the Poetry, Herbert A. Leibowitz. Heart Crane, A Reintroduction, Warner Berthoff. Then we, then we have Studies in the Bridge, compiled by David R. Clark. That looks like it's from the 50s. This one definitely is from the 50s. Uh, Heart Crane, An Introduction Interpretation by Samuel Hazo. Yeah. Then I have Heart Crane's Holy Vision, White Buildings. And uh, let me see, this is, who is this by? Oh, this is from the Duquesne Un University Press, multiple authors. Then we have The Poetry of Heart Crane, A Critical Study. Uh, and this is by, let's see, R.W.B. Lewis from Princeton. And then probably my, my favorite bad book of criticism all time is an absolutely atrocious book by Edward J. Bruner called Splendid Failure, Heart Crane and the Making of the Bridge. And I, I think it's, it's probably the worst interpretation of a poem because if you ask me, the bridge is so much more readable, it's so much more enjoyable, and it's so much more lucid than The Wasteland or any of Pound's cantos that for anyone to call it a failure shows how absolutely devoted to obscurantism uh, that the high modernists were, and even later postmodernists. So let me just, uh, uh, in, to round out this uh, first opening segment, um, what do you, both of you, think uh, is behind this decades-old diminution of Crane that only seems to have turned the corner in, in the early part of this century? I mean, we had basically about 70 or 80 years of Crane. Well, he was brilliant or had talent here or there, but ultimately he was a failure. If you looked up Hart Crane and put the word failure in, I'm sure you'd probably get more hits than any other word paired with his name. What do you think was behind that? So, yeah, go. Uh, yeah, so I think yeah, a lot of that comes from kind of two different places, I suppose. Um, I wouldn't say that necessarily all the books you just mentioned are terrible books on Crane. Um, you know, some of the things that, that Brunner does, for example, with the kind of what we now call a sort of genetic criticism, in the sense that he goes back to the manuscripts and he pulls out some of the ways in which the, the bridge progresses. is very interesting and very successful. And I kind of try and do a similar sort of thing in, in my book, so perhaps you shouldn't read it. Um, but it's certainly kind of some of the early, early criticism of, of Crane by his friends, um, Ivor Winters, uh, Alan Tate to an extent, um, uh, Goran Munson even, uh, these, these were people who are friends of his, he took great exception to. Um, and I think a lot of that was based on the fact that um, he left high school in his junior year um, and they didn't think he knew enough. Yeah. Um, they, they repeatedly say that. Uh, William Collis Williams is another one who has a go at him really for that. Um, he doesn't know enough, he doesn't have enough of, of what we'd kind of, as you were saying, kind of higher modernism. We would think about somebody like Eliot or Pound uh, or you know, Virginia Woolf, having a great deal of education, whether kind of self-educated or whether having gone through university systems. Um, and they've built up a tremendous amount of particularly classical knowledge. Uh, and so all those allusions which are in those texts, like the Cantos, like the Wasteland, um, are things that, that are difficult to decipher, but there's an expectation that you know what they are. There's an expectation that you as a reader are sufficiently educated as well to be able to work out what's going on. Now, there are plenty of allusions in the bridge, um, but maybe they're of a different type. Uh, and maybe Crane uses them in slightly different ways. So some of that is down to knowledge then. So it's not necessarily a kind of homophobic, although that is certainly, I think, there. Um, and the ways in which his uh, suicide uh, is equated with his style, quite often in the sense that the man and the work fail at the same time. Uh, he becomes an alcoholic. Uh, they don't like his sexuality. Uh, there's certainly critics, and, and, and obviously some of that goes back to some of the R.P. Blackmore as well, published in, in the early 50s. Yeah. Uh, and he finishes that essay, um, New Thresholds, New Anatomies, by saying um, that there is the, about him, the, the, his gifts are the heart of words, which he acknowledges positive things, the vitality of his intelligence, but the distraught and exciting splendor of a great failure. So Brunner is getting his quote from here, he's getting it from, from Blackburn. Um, so some of it comes down to his friends, I think some of it comes from that quite influential criticism in the 50s, uh, and some of it, I think you're right, it does come from, from a kind of uh, a sense of homophobia as well. Well, yeah, because uh, when you look at it, 
you go back to the romantic poets and all of their suicidal tendencies and self-destructive tendencies. And then you look at later poets, whether it's academics like a John Berryman or Robert Lowell or Sylvia Plath, who, you know, if Sylvia Plath hadn't killed herself and Hughes hadn't gone in and fucked around with her stuff, uh, who knows if she would have gotten, if she'd be Sylvia Plath today. It seems that Crane is an outlier in the sort of young, death, suicidal, uh, death-driven poets uh, of the last two or three hundred years, especially when we consider in the English language. Uh, and I, I don't know, other than sort of the homophobia, if you want to call it that, what else could have been driving behind it. Uh, Lanny, do you have any ideas other than maybe homophobia, what might have driven to this sort of uh, intense dislike of, of Crane uh -huh. and his work? Uh, yeah, well, I'd say, I'd say a couple of things. Neil's already covered some important points. That is, uh, Crane comes to modern poetry as an autodidact. Uh, he, uh, he's positioning himself differently from the high modernists. Um, he's wagering a, you know, an enormous uh, uh, amount on his poetry. He's got a, 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 a great big social vision. He's got a great big um, intense personal hope invested in poetry. So the stakes are extremely high. Um, the antipathy that you describe is intense too. Uh, almost proportional, you could say, to the ambition. Uh, but it's also, it's an antipathy that it, that is part of an ambivalence. Um, those writers who have been hardest on Crane in certain ways were also very close to him and intensely admiring of him. Um, so, you know, there's to say, if we you know, are looking at Tate or, or Winters or... Um, Blackmer. Um, so uh, Crane's kind of problematic position is one of uh, well, it, it, it's it's uh, he's a kind of uh, magnet for for a certain kind of ambivalence in, in the literary culture. Uh, he has always had his uh, defenders and rescuers and reintroducers. Uh, the um, uh, his his life, his story, his work. There's a sense that they're all bound up together, as as Neil is suggesting, and they've been continuously, intensely attractive to uh, subsequent writers, artists, critics. Um, Crane is is elegized, uh, you know, powerfully and beautifully over and over again in American poetry, from uh, John Brooks' wheelwright sensational rhapsodic uh, poem called Fish Food, or Marsden Hartley, the artist's um, uh, kind of uh, elegiac rants about Crane, uh, to uh, later figures like uh, Lowell or, or Creeley, uh, and you know, right, right on to uh, very recent poetry. I'm thinking of poems by Jeffrey Hill in, in Britain um, and um, and others as well. Um, I think maybe two years ago, um, maybe it's slightly longer. Uh, James Franco made a movie uh, about uh, Crane, so um, he goes on attracting um, uh, intense feeling. Uh, or Jasper Johns' paintings, uh, another sort of series of elegies and tributes. Um, uh, American culture has gone on being fascinated by him, and that the so I'd say that the negativity is is is, is a kind of um, is a kind of ambivalence and. Well, there have been those who have been ready to bury him. There have always been people ready to rescue him. Yeah. In between the segments here, I'm going to have some uh, video poems that I've done uh, of, of me reading some Crane poems and also a couple of poems of, of mine inspired by Crane. But uh, 
I want to end this first segment. In our next segment, uh, I want to talk about who Crane was, give a little biographical background for those people who've never heard of him to encourage them to find out about him. But I want to end this first segment uh, positing uh, Crane along a parallel track with another poet who was uh, very much despised uh, and one that is almost never thought of in the same vein as Crane because he did write in a very different way. And I'm thinking of Robinson Jeffers. Uh, now, Jeffers was someone who... Uh, was very much praised early on with his mature poetry once it was published. He was even on the cover of Time magazine. So he had a, a fame uh, in terms of uh, literate America that Crane never had in his lifetime. But his his sort of fall into ignominy is rather more explicable because of his views about the Second World War. His rise, though, in the last 20 or so years is also explicable in the sense that it count it very much in tune with the green movement, the ecology. He was very much a nature poet. He he, like Crane, was a Vatic poet in a sense, but yeah. in a very different way. Uh, so if Jeffers's rise and the attraction to Jeffers, his 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 downfall critically and uh, and then uh, his re rise, they're kind of explicable. Um, what do you think has been driving what I would say, since you talked about the books and works of art and uh, Franco's film and whatnot, uh, what do you think has been driving the sort of renaissance of interest in Hart Crane? Because Hart Crane is now, in a sense, more relevant and a bigger name than he was 20 or 30 years ago in the 80s. Well, well, I, mean, I think probably some of that uh, is definitely to do with uh, queer studies uh, within universities. Um, I think you, you go way back to Yingling's book, which is very early days in terms of uh, kind of gay lesbian criticism in the early 90s. Um, but that, if you think of some of the people who've, who've been inspired by Crane, or indeed some of the critics, they are probably coming from the kind of LGBT community. Um, and what they see, I think, in Crane is, um, is somebody who can be sort of adopted into, if he's not already there, into kind of political criticism, actually. And I think a lot of um, a lot of Crane's kind of politics, as Danny was saying earlier about the kind of social vision that he has, that's often ignored, actually, in favour of perhaps the uh, the kind of myth, the ideas, there's lots of myth that's involved with Crane, the way that he writes and, um, and the kind of eccentricities of it. Um, so I think that's probably part of it. I think it is part of a, a kind of socio-political um, concern within, particularly within America, but also perhaps within Europe, because he, he's still quite a popular poet uh, within Europe, if not necessarily taught uh, across universities in, say, the UK. He is taught and admired in, in France, for example, quite a lot. Mm -hmm. yeah, he's almost a French poet. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, with, well, in keeping with that, uh, when, I, when I joke about him being almost a French poet, which is amusing, too, because he really doesn't speak French, but, but, he, but he was certainly influenced by um, uh, the French poetry he read, that he, that he found a way to read and, and read in translation. Um, I would say two things uh, about his his work. One is that um, he um, he certainly locates himself in a romantic metrical tradition uh, in English poetry that uh, is carried forward in uh, various later poets. Uh, I mentioned Jeffrey Hill earlier. Uh, I mean, there's a way in which uh, Crane's work resonates with, with that particular tradition. However, uh, he's also uh, a highly disjunctive uh, and um, syntactically uh, difficult poet whose work has, I think, become more available to um, experimental poetry after so-called language poetry of the, the 1970s and so on. So that, uh, in this funny way, he uh, is available both for a kind of romantic metrical tradition and uh, an experimental anti-romantic, <laughs> uh, anti-metrical tradition. Uh, and, and so that's that's been a kind of, uh, uh, given him um, a kind of varied posterity. Uh, and um, also, as the metrical tradition has waned, uh, and um, an experimental tradition has become more prominent, I think Crane's become more central. Uh, it's certainly more, more readable in certain ways. I mean, he seems, you know, less strange 
uh, and maybe more contemporary uh, than than ever before. Yeah, one of the th- people that I would associate with him, uh, just in terms of uh, uh, the music of his poetry, would be uh, Gerard Manley Hopkins, because there are moments in, especially in, in the longer poems, the bridge, where you have something bump, 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 and then all of a sudden you get this breaking away where it's not a Whitmanian sort of barbaric yawp, but it's an intellectual yawp, and it it, it, it it just comes seemingly out of nowhere, although it has that sort of negatively capable uh, 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 essence that when you re- reread it a second or third time, you're like, oh, that makes perfect sense now. And I think that's one of the things that, for me, makes Crane an I hate I hate the language poets of the sixties and seventies because they were doggerless. But Crane is so far more inventive, and he's so much more daring. Not only in his time, but as you said, even now you can't you can't compare Def Jam poets and the spoken word crap to someone like Crane. This is a guy who who on a dime could change the tenor and the meaning of a poem with just sometimes just a a, a hyphen or a. Or, or a semicolon. Uh, so I think that's one of the things that that makes him uh, relevant. Uh, what What do you think about that? Just as a technical, uh, his technical his technical f- felicity. Yeah, it's, it's actually really interesting that, that I mean, he claims, of course, Crane, that he, he didn't read Hopkins until yeah. much until very very late in his career. Um, I probably around. Nineteen twenty-eight, yeah. So it, it's really pretty. I mean, we don't know, of course, whether you know, he's lying uh, or whether he's just sort of covering up for the fact that he had read it earlier. But it, it, if we take it at his uh, at his word, then it, it, he he he's very excited when he does discover Hopkins. Somebody sends him some Hopkins and says, "Look, this is a bit. This, you, this reminds me of you." And he says, "Yeah, that's it's astonishing. He's doing exactly the same kind of thing." Uh, I thought I, what I was doing was really original, but actually, this guy was doing it uh, ages ago. So, so there's definitely a sense in which he, he embraces uh, Hopkins. I don't know that he he is as obsessed, perhaps, with the kind of alliterative alliteration, say, that Hopkins is obsessed with. But mm. certainly, in terms of uh, the kind of mystical dimension or the spiritual dimension to Crane's work, that is also quite akin to, to what Hopkins was doing. Yeah, uh, uh, Crane to me, uh, and I don't know how uh, how much you know about uh, 20th century painting. I've always associated Crane with the precisionist painters, uh, the the modernism of those kinds of paintings. He his word choices bring to mind those kinds of paintings of these giant edifices, these these great works of mankind looking towards the future. That's that's what I always associate with Crane. Um, well, let's let's uh, end this segment here, and I want to just take a step back uh, in our next segment and talk a little about the man Crane, his youth, where he came from, and his life up until uh, the 1920s when he uh, sort of got into the poetic scene. And we'll do that when we return. Love me, chaplain, for heart Crane. The parlor is not for you, Dewey Mime. It is nothing but an immaculate zoo. The parable of time is not your enemy, but a comfort, in its way the all-eternal. Through its core I live you, love you, as my white retching gullet snares droplets of instant air from the tears you hang in the stained palette of expression. Between us commerces the death of millions, sundry wars, forgotten plagues, oblique famines, the ponderous steps of necessary progress, the gammon still shivered in rainfall, the evils of the stars and days, briefly. Your motion coincides with my axle of milk-churning lubricant, smiles subsume the worst we breed. Take me, your eyes, into no bestiality nor froth, and cleanse me from mourning. Oh, a thousand loves cherish your being, our flesh, poor I, am a charlatan grafting soul, celluloidly. In this segment, I want to talk about Hart Crane and sort of give a brief biographical sketch of who he was. A lot of people have assumed, I guess, that uh, he was from the intelligentsia. Other people have looked at his background and seen that his uh, father was the inventor of Lifesavers Candy and assumed that he was rich. Um, and neither of those is, is particularly true. There's, there's elements of, of that in both. So uh, I don't know, Neil, maybe if you want to start off, or Lanny, whichever one of you. Uh, Crane was born basically at the end of the 19th century. Uh, what was the milieu that he was born into? Yeah, so he, he says he, uh, I think when he's running to Taylor, he says he's, he had 
a, a toenail in the last right. century. Uh, yeah, he's born in, in 21st of July, 1899. Um, and he's born in, into um, a family in Garrettsville, Ohio, which is a very tiny place, actually. I mean, it's still today, I think it's only got about 2,000 yeah. people. But then it only has virtually just a 1,000. Um, and essentially what it's known for uh, is maple syrup. Uh, so it, it is the maple syrup capital of the world. Um, it, it's the largest centre in the world for doing this, and, and he's it, his his family is is uh, is kind of quite interestingly mixed. I mean, his his grandfather is this director of a bank, uh, but he's also in charge of this has this great factory, which does make a, a considerable amount of money. Um, and his father, um, who is called Clarence Arthur, is is known as C A for much of his life. Um, it, it marries. Crane's mother, who's a woman called Grace Hart, uh, very quickly, um, he, he seems to be quite interested. He sees that, I guess, that Grace Hart is, is quite a society sort of bell, really, in some respects. I mean, she, she behaves in a very um, kind of sophisticated manner and, and is quite interested in art and interested in uh, painting and poetry and the theatre. Um, and at one, later on, really thinks she wants to be an actress. Um, so he's very attracted to her, but they, they have this kind of whirlwind uh, romance, really. Um, and, and he dashes onto a train, rushes off to to kind of uh, get her hand in marriage, and eventually she agrees. Um, and her family is, is one that sort of makes money through clothing um, and has a, a, a roofing company in Chicago. So it, it, it's not it's not as you say, you know, very much the kind of the, the upper classes. Um, it's very much involved in, in different types of industry. Um, and indeed, his father works in this maple syrup factory for quite a while um, until he decides to strike out on his own and ends up in Warren uh, in Ohio, where the family eventually sort of relocates in, in 1901. Um, and it's at that point that a couple of things happen. One, his father starts becoming quite successful in terms of it makes a chocolate company, Crane's Chocolate Company, um, starts marketing different chocolates, eventually comes up with this lifesaver candy, which sadly he then sells on to another guy uh, for under $3,000. And then the guy makes it the centerpiece of this, this kind of million dollar um, candy company. Um, but it, the other thing that happens is that the domestic life starts to break down. Um, it, his parents fight a great deal. Um, Crane really finds this personally uh, very distressing. He has a number of kind of, I guess, nervous episodes. He's quite a nervous child. Um, and there's a number of times, basically between sort of 1908 and for about 10 years, when his, his parents break up, get back together, break up, get back together, and this goes on and on um, to the point where they eventually uh, end up in, in a divorce. But he's so strained by these things, in fact, that in around sort of um, about 1915, he he attempts to uh, take his own life a couple of times. Um, well, then he, wasn't his mother hospitalized uh, for, for uh, mental illness or something? Well, she also uh, attempted suicide later on, yeah. So, I mean, there's, so from, from a pretty early stage, um, it's clear that she has a degree of mental instability. Um, and, and that, I think, that definitely communicates itself to, to Crane. He's, he's somebody who, if he has a nervous disposition to start off with, it just is exacerbated by the, the family situation. Uh, Lanny, how about you, uh, comments on sort of the early part of his life? Yeah, well, uh, Neil's given you a nice picture. Um, just a couple of things I would um, highlight there. Um, I, interestingly, the family is involved in selling sweets, uh, you know, which is part of a new consumption economy, and, you know, kind of, Kind of cheap luxuries. That that's that's really what the, the family money is is, is involved in. Um, interesting because I think Crane's poetry, his whole experience, uh, has to be seen as part of a kind of emergent modern economy where um, pleasure uh, and. Uh, uh, well, and, 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 and indeed, um, uh, national marketing are, are kind of new uh, developments. And Crane himself, as he became an intellectual and became a writer, uh, would see himself uh, as part of a new generation uh, that was uh, distinguished itself from a Puritan uh, ethic uh, that had dominated American culture uh, that um, uh, endorsed um, 
personal freedoms and uh, uh, pleasures of, of all kinds. And this is this is important. There's a kind of uh, liberatory energy that uh, his life would be part of, and it has this kind of analog in, in uh, even in something as kind of homely uh, as the um, family candy business. Um, the um, uh, I, the Crane's relation to both his father and his mother are incredibly deep and volatile, uh, as, as uh, Neil is suggesting, and uh, deeply involved in the, the writer he became. Um, there's no question that, that Crane's, um, uh, Crane's drive to both put things together and to give voice to things that are broken and fallen apart uh, are, you know, is deeply resonant with uh, his home uh, and his experience of this man and this woman uh, passionately uh, loving and hating each other. Uh, and, and Crane took, uh, in many ways, his mother's side. You can, you can understand his name as, as a kind of attempt to put his parents together. Yeah. Uh, that is to say, he has his mother's surname and his father's surname, Park Crane. Uh, which was, uh, uh, as uh, you noted, um, uh, a um, uh, development from his birth certificate name, Harold Hart Crane. Uh, it's after the divorce. It's when he goes to New York um, as a oh, was it 17 or 18-year-old, very, very young person, 17-year-old, I think, uh, that he begins signing himself Hart Crane. Um, and... At any rate, uh, that that uh, that home life, that parental uh, conflict, uh, is absolutely central to the person he was and the, the writer he became. And one other uh, dimension I'll I'll just highlight briefly, which is that it Crane is an important way as a Midwesterner, uh, and um, I think that he, he part part of him is deeply invested in you could say Middle American values uh and he, he had a kind of uh and, and his, his patriotism you could you could understand this kind of rooted in this uh middle america uh the um, uh yeah in a sense of of uh, of um, living in uh, you know what used to be known as the western reserve of connecticut <laughs> that's what ohio is uh, and some of his family was from connecticut um that is, there's a kind of history of pioneering behind the family, and all of that's that's resonant uh, to the, the the vision of America that he that he had. Now, I believe Crane was uh, an only child. Is that correct? Mm-hmm. Um, I want to talk about one other member of his family before we talk about uh, Crane's sort of trek to New York and uh, the the post war jazz age and. Uh, you know, New York as the literary center of the world, in a sense, uh, in the 1920s. And that's his grandmother, one of his most famous uh, poems, or maybe not one of his most famous, but one of his uh, most, uh, I guess, anthologized poems is my grandmother's love letters. And I know Crane uh, had a lot of difficulty with his mother and father, but as far as I recall, he spent some years uh, away from that with his grandmother. And that's where uh, she apparently was a woman of uh, great uh, literary aspirations herself, had a tremendous library, and she introduced him to all of these great European and American writers. So uh, maybe one of you can talk a little bit about his years uh, before New York that he might have spent with the grandmother, what his grandmother may have influenced on him. Yeah, well, uh, you're right. I mean, in the sense that his grandmother, it's only really after she dies. Uh, that his grandmother becomes a problem um, because, of course, then his mother withholds all the inheritance um, and, and that makes him very, very bitter uh, towards her. And then, in a way, that kind of, I think, shifts that relationship that, that Lanny was describing where before he'd taken his mother's side and now he kind of actually gets starts getting close to his father and around sort of 27, 28, he becomes really quite very close to his father in a way that's completely unlike anything uh, that had happened before. And it's quite, if you read those letters around that time, it's very moving, actually, uh, to see how he kind of overcomes this difficulty that he'd had with him. But certainly, yes, the grandmother um, was somebody who, uh, as, as is kind of intimated in that poem, my grandmother's love letters, um, did have a, 
I guess a kind of to the outer world, perhaps a kind of hidden life, uh, in the sense that she ha he he suggests in that that she has desires, uh, which speaking on on kind of the point point of view of a uh, kind of an older woman seems almost a kind of a taboo sort of subject, kind of un unheard kind of sexual desires that he brings out in that poem. Um, indeed, when he when he writes to one of his friends about it, he says he's just finished the poem and uh, he's trying to get trying to get the finishing of the poem, uh, and then he's seen his grandmother, and then somehow that is uh, kind of made it much more difficult for him to actually finish the writing of the poem, just seeing him in, in kind of physically. So there clearly is, he's got a kind of imagined version of his grandmother. He's got a, a, a version of, of her who he somehow feels very akin to. And, and some of that may well be down to the fact that, you know, he talks in that um, about uh, how he would lead his grandmother by the hand through much of what she would not understand. It, it, what is it that she wouldn't understand? Is it his own kind of personal desires? Yeah. Uh, on a different level to hers, uh, but nonetheless, there's a sort of similarity in the sense that they have have these desires which other people cannot necessarily access for different reasons. Uh -huh. So there's a there's a great deal of intimacy clearly, and when he writes back to his uh, mother when he's in New York, wherever he is, he's always writing to her, his grandmother. Uh, quite often, he writes separate letters to his grandmother. I mean, there's a whole book of letters you can get between Crane and his family, um, which it, it, it's described in this kind of astonishing detail. Every, all that he's doing, he, he has a real, uh, clearly a very, very close relationship with her um, throughout throughout her life. Right. Uh, and uh, it's, the, it's the grandmother's property that is on the Isle of Pines in Cuba uh, that gives, well, that, the Crane family uh, winters there and it takes vacations there, and that becomes a kind of crucial uh, site for, for Crane and gives him a kind of access to um, culture to the, uh, the South uh, in a kind of hemispheric sense uh, that he might not have had uh, otherwise. I, I don't think that she was herself a particularly uh, intellectual. Um, influence um, uh, on him, uh, except insofar as she was uh, like her, like his mother too, uh, uh, ready, always ready to sponsor his writing and, and uh, his creativity and, and uh, uh, proud of, uh, proud of his uh, aesthetic side, we'll, we'll say that. Uh, um. So let's talk about uh, Crane uh, and his uh, going to New York. This was really at the when the U.S. got involved in World War One. Um, he's he hadn't even graduated uh, high school at that time. He goes to New York. This is right a, uh, a few years after the rise of uh, Elliot and Pound and Company. Uh, you know, and Poetry Magazine championing all these uh, what we now call the high modernists. Um, what? What was his life like? I know he tried to, I think, enlist for the army, but was rejected. Um, what were those first few years like? Was he just sort of sponging off his uh, father at that time? Well, that certainly did happen, and, and often his father would uh, reject some of his requests because it, essentially he, he goes to. I mean, it, I guess before you before we get to this, there's, there's also the sense of kind of Cleveland as well. I mean, Cleveland is actually really important to him, uh, particularly places like uh, Lacouf's La Bookstore, uh, which is an amazing bookstore which um, hosts all these little magazines which are published in New York uh, and Chicago. Um, and it's there, it's those magazines which really raise his aspirations as a writer. I mean, he sees these things and he says, I want to be published in those. Um, so he sees things like Bruno's Weekly and The Pagan. He's kind of now becoming a bit more uh, well known I guess but um, it, it, here that's sort of the last sort of uh, maybe last decade or so have kind of been more obscure magazines uh, but he sees those and he wants to get published in them um, and he also sees things like Little Review um, and poetry as you say and, 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 and Little Review is absolutely crucial as far as Little Review uh, Crane kind of holds up which is published in, in different places but certainly in New York uh, during this period by Margaret Anderson and Jane Heap I mean this is this is a uh, uh, the place where he, he thinks that's the ultimate publication 
destination, really. And years and years he spends uh, writing to them, uh, trying to, uh, and this is when he's when he's in uh, around Greenwich Village, uh, trying to work for them. Uh, he gets yeah, his the uh, yeah, he keeps going to the office and seeing Anderson and whoever's in the who is it, whoever's in there. So he makes a lot of connections that way by just meeting whichever writers or indeed visual artists are in that area. He gets his his father to put an advert in there. Uh, a friend of his, uh, Paul Tupovic, who's a, a ballet instructor, uh, and he gets him to put an advert in there. So he, he he tries to kind of get himself as close as possible to this coterie, I guess, uh, in around Greenwich Village. So that's I mean, 1916, and even before that, I mean, his his godmother is a is a great patron of the arts, and um, one of her her uh, sort of uh, most sort of uh, best known, I suppose, in the area uh, artist is a guy called Carl Schmidt, um, and Schmidt is a bit older than Crane. Uh, he's selling his kind of stall out as a visual artist, and he sort of takes Crane under his wing, really, and looks after Crane when he goes to New York, um, to the point where Schmidt gets a bit angry and, and, and uh, Crane keep, keeps bothering him, uh, goes to the door and um, every day, virtually, and knocks on the door and, and tries to use his bathroom and all these kind of things. So he, he, he's, very, he's very kind of, uh, he's very friendly with him, but to, Kind of to the point where Schmidt uh, thinks he should he should just go and make his own way in New York. So certainly he does that. He goes with Schmidt. Um, he, he writes back to his father things about New York. He says things like um, he, he's just uh, astounded by the multitude of people. He says um, it's as though you've lost yourself. We're trying vainly to find somewhere in this sea of humanity your lost identity. So it, he's it's that early from a relatively early stage. He is. Uh, very, very fascinated by the crowds, by the kind of urban experience, being in New York, um, which is so different, obviously, from coming from a, a town with you know, a thousand people. Um, so he's kind of astonished by that. So he certainly, he does his best to make connections. Uh, he does his best to make connections with as many writers uh, and people working in, in, in the little kind of um, the groups around Greenwich Village as he possibly can. So so he does. I mean, he, he has work published uh, eventually in the Little Review. Um, he publishes little essays. He writes letters to these magazines uh, and makes these connections with these avant-garde writers um, and artists, um, he, even though sometimes he's, he's seems he's going to be completely unsuccessful. Ezra Pound famously uh, advises Margaret Anderson not to publish Crane, uh, telling him that he just doesn't like his poetry. He thinks it's too uh, of the late 19th century, he thinks it's too decadent. Uh, but eventually they do, he publishes a poem uh, called In Shadow um, in uh, 1918. Uh, yeah, a couple of things to, to emphasize there. Uh, one was, um, well, uh, Neil's point that Cleveland was itself a uh, artistic center uh, and an important intellectual aesthetic um, point of orientation for Crane uh, and, and Crane's friendships and relations uh, there, including with the painter William Summer. Uh, you know, like Schmidt, Summer, uh, both painters, both sort of older figures that Crane looks up to and, and hangs around and <laughs> tries to. Uh, uh, kind of learn from and attach himself to. Um, Crane goes back and forth, really, between New York and, and Cleveland uh, for uh, oh, almost eight years or so, from 1916 to 1924. So he's he's in both places uh, uh, periodically, and um, uh, and the the art scene, the uh, intellectual scene, and the music scene in Cleveland were were very rich. Um, the uh, 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 world of the little magazines in New York, uh, extremely um, influential for Crane. Uh, he uh, he tries to figure out some way to make a living. He, he kind of proposes himself as uh, as a uh, uh, as the a advertising agent for the Little Review, uh, and as Neil says, he. Uh, he gets his father to place an ad. He gets a friend of his, Portofovich, uh, uh, de Dance, to uh, uh, put put his ad in the, the little review. But this is about all the success he has, and uh, it really doesn't uh, work out uh, as, as a way to uh, uh, earn the living that he needs and that his father, in particular, wants to see him uh, manage. He uh, he tries various. Uh, 
jobs in advertising over the years. Uh, and that's that whole relationship to the advertising industry, to the new consumption economy behind it. These are very interesting, important dimensions of Crane. Uh, he also goes back and uh, to Cleveland and works for the, the Crane Candy Company uh, and uh, eventually has a terrible falling out with his father. Um, uh, the whole difficulty that Crane experienced finding a way to live in the world uh, by making a living uh, is also a crucial piece of the story. Um, he basically he wants just to be a writer, <laughs> just to be a poet, uh, and every any every arrangement that he has is some kind of compromise, and, and he ends up failing in or abandoning or or uh, uh, getting rejected from, uh, and he can't can't seem to work out um, making money and making poetry. Okay, well, let's uh, end this segment there, and uh, in the next segment, I want to talk about basically the two uh, major books of Crane's lifetime, White Buildings, his first book, and then The Bridge, which was his final book, uh, and we'll talk about the poetry itself there. We'll do that in a moment. City Lights for Charlie Chaplin. I have never known the outcome of their last encounter, nor need to. The truth in old familiar hands revealed more than final denouement, yet too often the blindness of the seeing is the thing which cannot be repaired with each layer of early green shed to earth. Youth is supposed to learn, then soar in eclectic bloom to life's sun, mature and natural, but callow eyes focus too often on the petty rages, the sharp neon of the system, mesmers too many buds to early death, their raw, tender flesh once opened rots. In a soft genocide, quick with experience, the dancing pulse of city lights, where flute-fingered mimetics of a gentler bygone age flitted to horizon, lost for meaning, like dead tubers in permafrost. Yet the tramp, still painting lace portraits of sentimentalism to suicidal winos, and spreading bright flowers from one blind girl in her silent black and white world to this dun sea of blaring sightlessness, is more than a root. He is that nurse attending premature babies, yet weaned from drugs or alcohol, that lawyer defending the indefensible and the accused innocent, that counselor working on doped-up kids and founded unions of love, that deathless moth made blind by heaven's pure light. He is a sunflower, a warming throng of oneness, thralled in trope to humanity and its multi-toned plight. So when someone, anyone, next holds your hand with anxious eyes and asks if you can see now, do not shrink nor turn within to eyelids uncharted for true constellation is the jewelry of life in such query caress. Well, we've talked a bit about uh, Hart Crane, who he is, and a little bit about his early life. In this segment, I want to do a little bit uh, something different. Uh, Crane has probably a couple of dozen uh, poems that most people into poetry would uh, know about. But for those people who are just coming to Crane or maybe just stumbling upon a show like this, um, I'd like to talk uh, a little bit about some of uh, the poems that both Neil and Lanny think uh, you know uh, people should read uh, that are essential, if you will, uh, reading for Crane. Now, the first book that uh, he actually did publish was White Buildings. So maybe if uh, uh, Neil or Lanny can just give a, a minute or two background about how that book was published, and then we can talk about some of the work within that. So how, how, who published it and how did he uh, make that connection? So uh, getting it published was quite a struggle, actually. Uh, he, I mean, the, the main of the problem was that he sent it to different people. Um, he sent it to publishers who would write back. Um, you can see these if you ever go to uh, Columbia University and see the kind of the, the letters which have come to Korea. You can see uh, letters where people are running back saying, "This looks like really interesting work, but I just haven't the faintest idea what you're doing, so I can't publish it." Um, so that happens a couple of times, um, and eventually. Um, he's very good friends with a guy called Waldo Frank, um, who at the time is not terribly well known anymore, but uh, is a tremendously influential person. Um, he has he has great friends. He's great friends with Charles Chaplin, for example. Um, he knows Eugene O'Neill, um, and he asks uh, O'Neill um, if he would write a preface 
to white buildings. Um, and then um, LiveWrite, the publisher LiveWrite, would then publish it. Uh, O'Neill kind of uh, messes around, really. Uh, doesn't really understand what he's going to do. I'm not sure how enthusiastic he is about Crane's poetry, although Crane certainly was very enthusiastic about his drama. Um, and eventually, uh, Crane writes uh, an essay for him called General Aims and Theories, which he, he was not published during his lifetime, but he is now often read alongside his work, uh, sends it to O'Neill uh, as a kind of a, a primer, really, for his poetry. Uh, O'Neill apparently reads it, but then basically says he can't write it anymore, can't write the introduction. Um, so Livewright is, is basically committed to, to doing the book, uh, and eventually his friend Alan Tate steps in, um, despite the fact they've had... Uh, quite a sort of uh, angry dispute relatively recently, but Tate seems like, I guess, sees this as a way of possibly making up um, this this dispute and, and very generously decides to write this uh, really perceptive uh, introduction to White Building. So it's published then in, in 1926. Now, I know... Oh, go ahead, go ahead, Lanny. Were you going to say something, Lanny? No, go ahead. Okay. Uh, a lot of time, times that in a lot of artists, you see people talk about favoring one uh, portion or one uh, part of their life uh, over the other. And certainly White Building is the one that gets most of the praise and bridge most of the damnation. It's sort of like the old Woody Allen thing about the early funny films and then his later films. Um, why do you think that White Buildings uh, garnered so much uh, affection, if you will, from critics uh, and that so totally turned on uh, the bridge? When, if you look at it, the bridge almost seems inevitable as an outcome from the themes that are generated within white buildings. Well, uh, well, first of all, white buildings is a great book. It's just, you know, it's stunning. Um, and uh, in that sense, it, it sells itself. Uh, it is a... Um, it is a book that was, you could say, more easily assimilated by the emerging aesthetics of a kind of second generation modernism that would turn into the new criticism. Uh, that is to say, the scale of the poems, the, the, their structure, uh, although they're difficult and challenging, um, they... Um, they you know, nicely suit uh, at least some of the criteria uh, that were becoming standard uh, in, in, in uh, Anglo-American literary culture um, for judging poetry. So this is, this is a way in which the book's really, that, that first book is, is not problematic in a way that the bridge would become. Um, and uh, to the extent that the bridge represented a, a kind of epic extension of, of the motives and uh, manners of, of white buildings that um, was treated as a kind of betrayal of the uh, earlier uh, gift. And um, if the first book was something that could be assimilated by the new criticism, you could say that the new criticism was something that could make itself a little stronger by rejecting the bridge. Uh, I mean, that's to say that the bridge would challenge it. Uh, and, it, uh, you know, this kind of consensus I'm describing uh, uh, could, could uh, uh, bolster its, its um, authority, you could say, by uh, pointing to the bridge as a mistake, uh, something that proved its own rules. Uh, taking Voyages and For the Marriage of Faustus and Helen as singular poems, there's only 23 poems as I count them in yeah. in White Buildings. Um, so let me ask Neil and then Lanny, um, if there's two or three poems that uh, you were to point to in White Buildings to someone just coming upon the work of Crane, a young poet or, or someone just wanting to read uh, about, you know good poetry, what two or three poems might you suggest? And they could be on a qualitative level, on a biographical level, thematic level, political, whatever. Which 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 two or three poems would you uh, recommend someone to read? Uh, you know, essentially out of that collection. Well, I would say uh, you can't do much better than just start with the first poem, actually. Uh, yeah, and there's a number of reasons for that, really. Um, 
if you think about the the, the kind of epigraph to the whole book, uh, which is a Rambo uh, epigraph, uh, uh, basically kind of um, suggests that, uh, to kind of paraphrase it, um, it, it can't be anything else but the end of the world approaching. Um, there's a sense in which, yeah, as soon as you read that, uh, even if he hasn't provided the translation, but assuming you know the French, um, there's, there's a sense in which you know, the whole book is got to be about uh, ideas of reality, what it is, uh, possibly even apocalypse, what is the end of the world, uh, what is the end of the world mean in the mid of the 1920s, and, and it which seems like a strange thing in some ways for him to say, given that if you think about what we assume the 20s to be like, particularly in New York, uh, or the kind of urban centres, uh, to be this extraordinary lively period, it's not until the end of the 20s when the crash happens and depression begins that uh, we feel that things are going downhill. But actually, to, to make that kind of statement, and indeed, this first book, in, this first poem in the book, Legend, uh, which you know some critics have, have suggested, does that suggest like a map legend? Does this suggest a way of reading the whole book um, just by this first poem? Um, and and it, it very much engages with this idea about reality. So he, in the first couple of lines of it, where he says, as silent as a mirror is believed, realities plunge in silence by, and then he has these this ellipsis, these three dots, uh, that immediately indicates to us that you're not, this is not a typical book of poetry. Uh, this is not a, a book of poetry that's going to give you um, just one way of looking at the world. It's going to offer you different versions. Um, and I think that's very much kind of then links in with, with the rest of the book. Um, I think it is actually, despite the fact that um, there are some of the poems which are kind of problematic um, emblems of conduct basically is plagiarism uh, he kind of stole that uh, from another writer until pieced it together another guy called greenberg who had died uh, yeah. a few years previously but apart from that there's a i think there is a, a sense of continuity that runs through it from legend uh, which suggests these ideas about kind of challenging our sense of what the world is um through ideas of, of memory which is also kind of intimated in that poem um ideas about desire that's in there as well because when the next bit of that poem the, the, the third fourth lines i'm not ready for repentance nor to match regrets it's a really powerful statement by a, a pretty young guy really uh, to suggest on the first hand that he's got things to repent uh, but also to say that he's not going to repent anything. He's just going to go ahead and press ahead with whatever vision of the world that he has. Um, and he's he's going to uh, present that to you wh whether you like it or not, really. And, and given this is the first part of the book, you're going to get a lot more of this. Um, so I think that's a, that's a pretty uh, a astonishing beginning um, and does suggest a number of things about some of the later poems which engage with, with visual art, which engage with uh, Charlie Chaplin, engage with uh, kind of cinematic representations of the world. Um, there's a kind of uh, elements of kind of ekphrasis in there, Sunday Morning Apples, the one which, which Lanny was talking about, his uh, kind of great friend William Sommer back in Ohio as uh, a painter. Um, that's very much kind of seems to uh, represent specific paintings by Sommer. So he's, he's exploring what words can do. He's exploring how do words, how can we sort of shift words so that they actually give us visual, kind of verbal representations of visual things uh, in that kind of poem as well. So, so legend, I would say, I would also say uh, you, you can't read through uh, the book without engaging with for the marriage of Faust and Helen. Um, I mean, it, it's a three-part poem. I think the first part particularly is successful. Um, I, I find the kind of the, the second section, which is a kind of attempt to, to get jazz uh, into writing, so less successful. Uh, uh, the third part is, and, and this whole poem is really a way of responding to, to Eliot's Wasteland, um, because it, it very much engages with kind of what it, what is the first world, what's the effects of the first world war um, on in the third section particularly uh, on America and and, um, and that kind of destruction of bodies. Um, and indeed, he talks actually about sort of aeroplanes. Um, that's a sort of terror uh, that's in the third part of that poem. Uh, but that first section particularly. I think it's just an exception. Uh, he, he starts off by talking about uh, this mundane urban um, space. The mind, he says, it's shown itself at times too much the baked and labelled dough divided by accepted multitudes. The multitudes seem to go all the way back to those early letters he has to his father where he's talking about uh, being amongst those multitudes in New York and being sort of oppressed by them. Um, across the stacked partitions of the day, across the memoranda, baseball scores, the stenographic smiles, stop quotations, smutty wings flash out equivocations. So it, it, it's a very tight poem, actually, in terms of the way that it's constructed. Uh, but what he seems to be describing is this, again, another challenge, kind of challenge to 
what it is to live your daily, mundane, pretty boring life, actually governed by figures, statistics, numbers. Um, but actually, he's suggesting that the mind is capable of much more than that. It's much more sophisticated and ambitious, and that's what it should be. So when he progresses through that first section of the poem, um, he, he has this remarkable, these remarkable three lines in italics, um, just after the, the second stanza where he says, there is the world dimensional for those untwisted by the love of things irreconcilable. And then another three dots that he often puts in, uh, as if to kind of make you think, um, which is a really kind of strange way of thinking about uh, thinking about things. I mean, what, what is, he seems to be kind of deliberately twisting it around again to challenge uh, your version of, of what you might uh, assume about the world. So if, if the world dimensional is for those untwisted, what about those who are twisted? And if they are twisted, what does that actually mean? Um, are, have they somehow got access, those who are twisted, to the world undimensional or a different dimension, an alternative dimension to the one he's just been describing, this kind of mundane um, uh, urban environment? Um, and, and so, I mean, the way I would sort of read that is, is that he's certainly talking, as he goes on to talk about um, sexual desire, he's talking about a, a, a kind of uh, an alternative form of desire, um, a homosexual desire and a queer vision of the world, um, which it, it kind of gives, it, it's privileged, actually, rather than sort of saying, well, you know, there, there's one version, which is the, the normative heterosexual version, which is uh, the one we should all accept. He's calling that the kind of dimensional one, and he's suggesting that what he's just described is associated with that. So that's actually mundane. It's not exciting, and it's not uh, very visionary. Whereas, in fact, what he suggests is then leading you into this alternative dimension. He then meets, he suggests you meet uh, Helen. Um, hence the, kind of the title of marriage of Faustus and Helen. It gives you access to uh, a completely different um understanding of the world, a completely different kind of mythical version of the world. You are, you are accessing these things through, uh, through a form of desire. And again, desire is another thing that runs through, uh, through the book. I'll, maybe I'll leave it there and I'll, I'll stay, see if Lenny has any to come back on. Yeah, go ahead, Lenny. <laughs> well, um, I, you know, um, poems I would recommend to people starting on hard crane. Um, I, I would say that, that the book is full of seductive language that one would do well simply to uh, submit to. Uh, poems like Passage or Repose of Rivers or, or Emblems of Conduct itself, that, that text uh, plagiarized from Samuel Greenberg. Uh, these are, are um, poems that are... Uh, made out of line-by-line line, uh, stunning phrases. And there's a kind of uh, rhetorical power and uh, conviction and authority uh, in the writing that um, uh, you just want to somehow tune into uh, before you even worry about interpreting it. Uh, Voyages is one of the stunning love poems in the 20th century. It's a, it's a great, great poem, and, and uh, it does a lot of different things. Uh, it's, as you suggested earlier, Dan, it's, you know, it's a sequence of poems. Um, and uh, I think it holds uh, in, in it um, a whole erotic, visionary narrative about uh, immersion, exchange, uh, loss, and consolidation that uh, is extremely powerful. Uh, and and I, I really don't know any poetry that, that, that gets near that uh, level of intensity uh, and invention. Uh, and and uh, I think that uh, any reader uh, who uh, is willing to open herself or himself up to uh, that poem is going to be uh, uh, persuaded and rewarded. Uh, the uh, uh, so that there's so there's there, there's a kind of uh, linguistic power in the book that you just want to locate and uh, 
uh, give yourself to. There, there are uh, visionary poems of the kind uh, Neil was just describing, or where the voyages represent. Uh, and then I guess I, I just finished by saying there, are, uh, there are also uh, there's also a kind of poem in the book that uh, uh, is more a little more homely and anecdotal. Uh, that's appealing too. Uh, uh, Neil mentioned uh, the uh, uh, William Summer poem about the apples, but we've already talked about my grandmother's love letters. Uh, well, we can add to that maybe Chaplin esque, uh, the uh, a kind of tribute to Chaplin, uh, a, uh, a poem that reminds you that this is poetry being written uh, in the era of silent film. Uh, uh, a poem that, that uh, kind of takes you into the, the, the theater and presents Chaplin as a kind of figure for modern man, uh, and in particular, uh, the kind of uh, uh, artistic, aesthetic uh, uh, experience and consciousness that, that Crane wanted to represent. Uh, and, and there's more. Uh, it, it's a book of, of uh, uh, riches, uh, although it just has 20-something poems. Uh, I think even you know the small and slider ones uh, uh, are, are, re are really compelling. You had mentioned ekphrasis uh, earlier, and uh, for those who don't know, ekphrasis is an art derived from another art. And uh, the poem Chaplinesque is one of several uh, ekphrastic poems in that collection. Um, and the interesting thing I find about Chaplinesque, and I'll have a, a poem video of that, me reading that uh, somewhere in here. You know, if you look at the last, uh, the last uh, uh, lines there, the game enforces smirks, but we have seen the moon and lonely alleys make a grail of laughter of an empty ash can, and through all sound of gaiety and quest have heard a kitten in the wilderness. And that, it's interesting because he's talking about the tramp character of Chaplin, uh, who was an outsider come to America playing a guy at the bottom of society. And then later on, on he picks up in the section of the bridge talking about uh, basically a hobo camp, a hobo jungle. And a lot, it, it's interesting to see how the things that, uh, uh, are dealt with uh, uh, towards the end of Chaplinesque, and the whole evoking of Ashcan, I, I think, has to be sort of a uh, a little aside to the Ashcan school of painting as well, um, uh, because uh, there's a lot of a sense of uh, in Crane's poetry of this sort of uh, uh, rugged, manly kind of thing in a slightly Whitmanian way, but a, a bit more modern sense of it. I mean, sailors and and vagabonds and ruffians uh, occur right. in his his poems there uh, and yet he he's somehow distant from it looking at it in, in chaplinesque you know up on the screen talking about these images uh, and then there's two other poems that uh, just want to get your comments on the other poem is at melville's tomb which uh, maybe isn't quite a classic except if you want to say that he, he's looking at the work of a prior writer um that's that's probably maybe the most anthologized poem uh, I think in that collection. Um, do either one, you want to talk a little bit about that poem? What was uh, Melville's influence on Crane, and uh, do we know why he wrote that poem? Well, that's one I think I've written about fifty pages on. So <laughs> uh, there, there's, there's a lot to say. Um, we have to remember that Melville was not much read or certainly respected uh, until the, centennial. the early 20s. Um, uh, Raymond Weaver, a professor of American literature at Columbia, writes uh, Melville, Mystic and Mariner. And uh, Crane actually reads this. And, uh, there's a kind of mythologizing of um, Melville as um, a sailor a doomed sailor, you could say, um, uh, that a myth that, that combines the image of the sailor with um, uh, the visionary writer, the author of Moby Dick, who's not read or understood, uh, and in that sense, kind of mystic intelligence. Um, and Crane propounds in the 
this short poem a kind of, um, well, his own sort of myth uh, of the writer uh, as a kind of drowned figure whose message uh, still comes to shore, you know, like a message in a bottle or, or, or somehow otherwise delivered to those who are receiving it. Um, this becomes a kind of image of cultural history. Uh, the possibility that, that uh, in one's, um, uh, even in one's failure to return to that word you introduced earlier, Dan, that's always associated with Ukraine, that some kind of message might be sent forth that later audiences will receive. Uh, this is the kind of drama of the poem where Crane is himself putting himself up as a, a reader of Melville, who's kind of getting getting Melville's message uh, still alive and potent, uh, or he calls it a portent, uh, portent wound in the corridors of shell. Um, it's a it's a it's also a way to understand Crane's own poetry, and in fact, a poem such as this. Um, that is to say, uh, the poem as a kind of um, vessel that carries an encrypted message to be activated by later uh, like-minded readers. Uh, I think Crane thought of his own work this way, and uh, and then so in short form. Poem gives a kind of, uh, you know, creates a kind of myth of literary history, of uh, a kind of uh, model for Crane's own poetics. Uh, and behind this, too, is a sense of um, the author as a heroic, doomed figure, male, uh, possibly homosexual. Um, uh, someone living at sea, that is, without a specific location outside the social realm, uh, and uh, in that way, uh, uh, a kind of heroic figure and also a vulnerable one. Um, Neil, any comments on that poem? Well, that, that, that's, well that's a great reading of that poem. I, I think it's not much more to add to that, but it is interesting that uh, this is the one that he sends to Harriet Monroe, uh, and yeah. she objects to, uh, really, and doesn't really, right. has a number of lines she just can't understand. So they <laughs> end up having this back and forth uh, in uh, poetry, which is, which is a fantastic, actually, uh, kind of activist access into what Crane is thinking. So it, that's often, again, an S kind of essay although it was letters originally, uh, in 1926, kind of explaining what this poem is doing. Um, and he talks there about the, the logic of metaphor, uh, which is this, this phrase which is often associated with him, uh, which, which kind of talks about how there was sort of illogical, he, he calls them kind of so-called illogical impingements of the connotations of words on the consciousness. In other words, it kind of, it's a kind of high-flown way of, of sort of um, sort of dream logic, I suppose, in a way we might quite think about it, in the sense that connotation, what something connotes to one reader might be quite different to what it connotes to another reader. So you read this and, and you look at, the, the, particularly the lines that, that she picks up, she doesn't get, are things like the diced and drowned men's bones he saw bequeathed an embassy, um, that kind of idea. How can bones be diced, this kind of suggestion. And he, he's, he's suggesting that there is a way in which, if you think about dice which are made of bones he's, he's asking you to make that leap that kind of uh, cognitive leap um, which he does and I think you know kind of you were alluding to this earlier Dan about the, the way in which um, just two three words put together suddenly mean a whole kind of uh, universe of different things uh, as far as Crane is concerned um, and that's precisely what the logic of metaphor is about it's about giving you kind of connections um, which he's kind of asking you to make um, in terms of kind of your synapses, really. Um, and, and that's the sort of thing which he, he tries to defend a lot of the time uh, in terms of his, his writing. He, it's not a scientific thing. It's a terminology he talks about in terms of shorthand. Uh, and he thinks that poetry can do that. He thinks that it has a, a quality which by its very kind of intense, um, kind of a, a, a almost efficient nature, uh, it's almost like a, it's like, a bit like William Carlos Williams talks about poems being machines. It's a bit like that. It's a bit like it can work in such a way that it can connect lots of different, apparently 
disconnected things together and it can have an emotional effect on you as the reader. But of course he says, yeah, okay, some readers will like it and some, they, some won't. You know, you can get it and some people just won't get it. And that's just how poetry is, really. Yeah, the thing, the thing with, uh, that I always tell young poets who ask me for advice, I say, when you get a cliche, for example, you can use a cliche and undermine a cliche uh, by not even using the cliche. For example, you took something like a bleeding heart and you had a word that sounded like bleed or, and a word that sounded like heart, or you took, replaced one of those words uh, and put it in a different context, say, instead of a love poem, put it in a political poem about you know, wobblies or something, you're going, you're going to undermine it, but you're going to get the, you're going to trick the mind of the person into the comfort of a cliche. And I think one of the things that Crane does very well throughout his poetry is he'll have a line that is seemingly classical. And then you go to the next, the next uh, line and you get a cluster of words that go from the 19th century to maybe the 21st or 22nd century and what they're trying to visualize. And that's the thing I think that throws off people like the Harriet Monroe's. Uh, uh, and they, they can't make that leap. They can't make that Keatsian uh, leap. Uh, and in a similar way, I wanted to talk uh, about one final poem before we move on to the bridge. And that's Lacrimae Christi. And I'm not, I'm not a religious scholar. Uh, and I know this poem is, is often thought of as being one of the three or four poems that deal with alcohol in that collection. Uh, but I've heard some people who, who know far more about, uh, about uh, the supposed biblical passage that the term for the wine comes from, the Jesus wept. And I don't know which book it's from or whatnot. And I don't, I don't know the mythological stuff behind it. But um, there's certainly in, in that poem, you can read beyond just the alcohol uh, references, references there. Uh, do either of you uh, have any interpretations of that poem holding any of uh, Crane's spiritual or religious beliefs uh, there? That's a tough one. Yeah, I'm asking because I'm not religious, so I, I you know, I, I've, I've only seen, known, like, I was just Googling and I saw Clayton Eshelman basically talking about the alcohol version of the poem. But I've, I've heard people say that before, and I, I'm sure probably in the next decade or two there'll be some reinterpretations of that and other poems. Um, but, I mean, if, if you guys don't uh, have any uh, insight on that, that's fine, too. We can move on to the bridge. Crane was from a uh, Christian science family. Yeah. Uh, and I think uh, this uh, and, and science, as he called it, uh, was very powerful for his mother. Uh, I think probably mattered more to him than, than we usually are ready to admit uh, or allow. Um, uh, nonetheless, I don't think um, Crane had a deep investment in the Gospels or. Um, Christian thinking generally. Um, I think that poem uh, has as much to do with reading Nietzsche uh, and, and thinking about Dionysus and uh, kind of connections between Christian and classical myth as it, as it does any kind of uh, real Christian theology. Um, I think that uh, Lacrimae Christi, as you mentioned, uh, you know, the tears of Christ are, are uh, is, is a um, was also a, uh, a way of referring to the wine, uh, bootleg wine that, that Crane was drinking, um, and um, you know, these these things are are, are combined and, and, and mingled. Um, it's a it's a poem that he wrote in the. I think around 1924, um, and you see little drafts of it appearing in his letters. Um, it's it's uh, it's one of his most um, uh, enigmatic, I think, and and, and uh, uh, puzzle puzzle like uh, that. Really, well, just just to kind of carry forward uh, a thought that uh, Neil was suggesting. Uh, with respect to Crane's comments on Al at Melville's tomb uh, in a, his letter to Harriet Monroe, Crane really wants his poetry to be an experience. It, it, he wants it to be an experience that can be shared with the reader. And um, uh, this seems to me a, a kind of poem that 
ask for that kind of immersion uh, uh, and that kind of intensity uh, of response while giving us very little in the way of kind of framing device or interpretive cues to uh, help us along. Uh, it really asks us. It really, it really passes the bottle, as it were, uh, and, and asks you to, to drink. So a couple of years pass uh, between uh, white buildings and then uh, the publication of the bridge. Uh, before we get into the bridge proper, uh, what happened in those interim years? Uh, did he get uh, a name? Uh, was he just uh, rousting about uh, lazily? What what was going on in Crane's life in between the two books? Well, he, he, certainly, he, uh, he, I mean, he, a number of important things happened to him, I guess, which we should probably mention just sort of around the sort of middle 20s, I suppose, and, and love affairs is one. I mean, he, he uh, meets a guy called uh, Emil Odfo, who's a, a kind of Danish-born um, sailor. Uh, and of course, he has various relationships with sailors, but this is like a, actually an important sustained one. And uh, Odfo inspires a, a number of poems, particularly sections of voyages. Um, and, and it's around that kind of period in those kind of early 20s that, um, that alcohol starts being more and more of a problem. I mean, it, it, there is a Kind of, I, I suppose, a, a consensus that he, uh, when he's not feeling particularly inspired, he, he relies on alcohol to inspire him. Um, and I think that's overdone, uh, but I think it's true, obviously, to an extent, uh, that he starts to kind of rely on that a bit more. Um, and of course, in, in uh, the middle 20s, um, around kind of the, the publication period of, of White Buildings, he gets $2,000. Uh, from Otto Kahn, uh, the, the great patron of, of so many uh, kind of writers and artists, and to work on the bridge because he, he's already started thinking about the bridge in, in 1923, as early as that, uh, has some ideas about this kind of um, synthesis of America, as, as he calls it at various points. Um, and, it, and it's in 26 actually that, having written a bit of the bridge, um, he then drafts about half the thing. Um, on, uh, as Lanny was saying, the Isle of Pines. So he goes there and, and, and from, uh, I think it's sort of May to October, has this extraordinary, uh, extraordinarily productive period, whereas before he'd been writing very little, almost nothing on the bridge, but he really wanted to do it. But then in 26, suddenly, he just has this breakthrough. Uh, he has these wonderful letters to Waldo Frank where he, he talks about hearing an absolute music again, uh, which he'd kind of lost prior to that. Um, so he, he's kind of really on the up as far as 26 is concerned because the, the book comes out towards the end of 26 White Buildings. Um, he then does a couple of really weird things. He goes off as a, a kind of intellectual companion um, to a guy called uh, Herbert Wise. He goes off to California um, and lives in, in a place called Altadena for a while. Uh, and Wise is quite a young guy, um, but he's made a lot of money, uh, and he needs somebody to kind of come and, I don't know, stimulate him intellectually or something. And it, it's a very strange period. Um, he, the grandmother dies, um, he, his mother prevents him from, from accessing the inheritance. Um, but around 28, he, he uh, decides that, somewhat belatedly, uh, to go to Europe. So he goes to London, um, and then he goes to Paris. He again meets the whole kind of runs the gamut, really, of, of international celebrities, as far as literary is concerned. Um, meets Gertrude Stein, uh, he meets people in London, Laura, Laura Riding, Robert Graves. Um, he meets a number of others that are well-known, has his picture taken uh, by Man Ray. Um, so he, he, he meets all these kind of artists and, and literary figures in, in Paris as well. But he is kind of there a bit late. I mean, a lot of the, the kind of the lost generation... Uh, although if you go to uh, Greenwich Village and you see the plaque on the wall, one of the houses, many houses where he lived around that area, it does say he was part of the lost generation. He, well, I don't think he really was. Uh, he didn't really fit into that bracket of people in the right, kind of early 20s, really. Um, so he's kind of there belatedly, but nonetheless, he's still getting the influence. He, he's also spending time in jail. Uh, he spends about six days in jail in Paris uh, for drunken behaviour. Um, but he starts at this point to kind of take that material that he's written the Isle of Pines and subsequently about the bridge starts revising it. Um, very importantly, in, in Paris, he meets uh, Harry and Caress Crosby, who eventually are the publishers uh, for Black Sun Press um, of, of the bridge in uh, 1930. He revises the, the poem um, rather tragically. Uh, Harry Crosby, uh, it's kind of assumed that he was with one, a lover of his in a hotel and they seem to commit a double suicide. 
Um, but nonetheless, Caress decides that she's still going to press ahead with the book. Um, so he sends her uh, the final sort of revisions of it in, in 29. And, and Boney and Live Ride uh, in, uh, in the US decide that, that they'll publish an American version uh, of the book in 1930. So it, it comes out in 1930. Well, now, for those who don't know, uh, The Bridge is a long poem. It's probably, depending on on the typeface, you know, anywhere from 45 to 60, maybe 70 pages. Uh, it's uh, got a, an opening prome to Brooklyn Bridge and then eight major sections, Ave Maria, Powhatan's Daughter, Cuddy Sark, Cape Hatteras, Three Songs, Quaker Hill, The Tunnel, and Atlantis. And clearly we're going to, you know, this is not by any means anyone listening, we're going to inevitably short shrift the poem that you can't do that in a 15 minutes or so describing the poem. But let's talk in terms of some of the bigger overall arching themes and maybe a few of the, the moments to both of you that illustrate some of the points that you think are the key moments in that poem. Um, the bridge title itself uh, has been uh, debated. Uh, you know, it, the opening poem is to Brooklyn Bridge, but clearly it means more. What do you think was the aim of the title and, and the subsequent poem? Either one. Uh, well, uh, you know, it, it's a wonderful poem. It's a fabulous poem. It's also a totally bizarre poem. This is, this is an apostrophe to the bridge, to the, to the Brooklyn Bridge. I mean, this is a kind of crazy thing, right? If you saw somebody standing on Brooklyn Heights and saying, you know, oh, bridge, you'd think this is a mad person. Uh, the uh, crane, crane refers in that, um, uh, in that poem to uh, the bridge as, uh, I'm just opening it, so I've got my phrase correct. Um, he, he speaks of um, the bridge as the Ter uh, terrific threshold of the prophet's pledge, the prayer of pariah and the lover's cry. Uh, it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's a poem that, you know, is prophetic. It's, a, it's the prayer of a pariah uh, and it's the cry of a lover. Uh, and, and Crane wants to see in this particular structure uh, a symbolic form that he projects as the form of American culture and its uh, past and future. And uh, he proposes, uh, by the end of the poem, um, he asks uh, the bridge to, in effect, lend a myth to God, uh, which is a, a great phrase. Uh, you know, it's the notion is that this is a uh, this is it's a kind of choice. Uh, uh, Crane saying, you know, let's let's make a myth. Let's let's uh, let's borrow a myth. Let's take this form and use it uh, to give some uh, structure uh, and and plan uh, by which we can understand the working of divinity. Uh, and um, in other words, it's not claiming some kind of scriptural truth or inevitability. There's some kind of admission of rhetorical contingency. Uh, and uh, he's, uh, you know, uh, using, using that uh, New York City landmark to uh, frame and, and introduce his, his vision of America. Yeah, you know, you had mentioned, uh, I think it was might have been Neil who'd uh, mentioned uh, the lost generation. Um, I want to just read the, the two uh, lines that end the prome. Unto us lowly is sometimes sweep, descend, and of the curve ship lend a myth to God. So it's important, I think, to note that I think this poem, unlike lots of people in the lost generation, he's talking to the average guy, to Joe Average, the working man, whereas the Elliots and the Pounds and, and all of the... Uh, uh, who who is the the, the roundtable Algonquin roundtable type folks of that era were certainly not aiming there. It, those people are writing. If I were to to you to use a metaphor, they were writing to the kind of people who would be attracted to Ingmar Bergman type films later on. Whereas Crane was writing, I think, more to John Cassavetti's film, uh, people in the <laughs> Cassavetti's film. Um, do you, Neil, for example, uh, see uh, in that poem sort of his raising up of 
the overlooked, the 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 bums, the 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 guy who goes and punches a time clock and trying to raise that up to something higher. Yeah, I think I think that's true. I mean, I think he's um, I suppose he's also concerned that he's going to watch a Chaplin as well. Because they're, they're the kind of people we, we the thing I used to think about Chaplin he can appeal to so many people. But yeah, I mean that's that's the everyday uh, person. That's true. If you think about to Brooklyn Bridge and, and who is actually in it, uh, he does start sort of. Um, kind of addressing the bedlamites um he talks about the people who are going up and down in the elevators um who are sales people who are advertising people as well people who are in cinemas uh people who work uh he mentions uh, you know the the uh we mentioned wall street he talks about um, a ripped tooth of the sky is acetylene so people who might be working uh, with acetylene in other words actually doing welding and that kind of thing which crane actually did do very unsuccessfully uh, for a short period um that kind of thing that kind of that's very much kind of the, the, kind of the, the working uh, group and then, of course that's what comes in later on when you get to something like the river um uh, when he is as, we, as you mentioned earlier looking at the hobos uh, and thinking about people who are riding the rails in order to get from place to place because they don't have the money to, to travel on the on the railway uh, absolutely i mean that that's he, what he's trying to do of course is he's trying to do the kind of whitman-esque thing of encompass everybody bring everybody in. um and, and in a way that, that whitman doesn't he also rather problematically um engages with native american people as well um, so it, it's very much a kind of it, it attempt to I can't, almost, almost a kind of encyclopedic version of everyone in America from uh, what I guess many people at least at the time would have regarded as the kind of founding so the first section is Columbus uh, through to uh, the present day yeah you mentioned uh, the river and that's a, a subsection of the the second part, portion of the poem, Powhatan's Daughter, it's actually sort of five poems uh, that make up that section, Harbor Dawn, Van Winkle, The River, The Dance, Indiana. And I would say that reading through the criticism, that seems to me to be the most admired section of the bridge, even by those who call him a, call the poem a failure. Um, maybe if we could talk a little bit sort of about the, that sort of fugue of those five poems and uh, what they represent within in the actual uh, larger uh the bridge. Well, um, the Harbor Dawn locates uh, locates the section of the bridge, and to an extent, locates the bridge as a whole at one ten Columbia Heights, where Crane lived with Emil Oper uh, for a time, and uh, in in you know with the with the sight of the vision of the bridge out of the window. Uh, and it's a love poem. Uh, and importantly, Crane wants to, you could say, you know, create a epic vision of the culture and the nation that um, uh, incorporates or is even kind of written from a point of view of the love lyric, uh, and in particular, the homosexual love lyric. Uh, the Harbor Dawn is a, a beautiful poem. Uh, it segues into um, the poems you mentioned. Uh, the river is the is the is the real showstopper there, yeah. um, and it's you know uh, it's about Mississippi, uh, but it's also about you could say um, uh, roads and channels and passages uh, in the nation, uh, and and it evokes the human life on the continent as a uh, kind of history of movement uh, and, and motion. Uh, the dance uh, is, is a strange uh, a strange kind of um, uh, vision of um, you know, kind of erotic uh, sadomasochistic uh, uh, quasi um, ballet russe a uh, modernist uh, performance uh, in which um, Crane identifies with uh, the uh, some Native American uh, brave that is uh, uh, killed, and sacrificed, and Indiana is uh, the the last section, uh, and it's uh, it's actually uh, a a uh, mother's dramatic monologue uh, written after Crane had uh, a mother lamenting
Hunting Philosopher Son, uh, written after Crane had, had run away from his mother in the way that Neil suggested earlier. Uh, it's described by Alan Tate as a nightmare of sentimentality and, and others. Uh, you know, as, as one of the real low moments uh, in the uh, poem, uh, but Crane certainly understood it as having its place too, uh, uh, and with all sorts of complex uh, uh, representation of the interaction of the uh, uh, pioneers and settlers and the Native Americans that they're displacing. That's part of the uh, part of the poem's point, I think. Um, anyway, uh, I've just sketched something that's enormously complex and messy, and, and uh, you know, suggests the you know richness as well as the kind of ethical and political complications of this this very ambitious poem. Neil, any comments from you? No, oh, that that's that's exactly what I think is going on. Here. I mean, it's, it's it's interesting that that he's. He seems to be obsessed with beginnings. Uh, that might be because there were so many beginnings to the poem. He kept writing it and stopping and writing again. Uh, but Van Winkle has all these references to, again, uh, something which I haven't talked about so much yet, but kind of the number of puns, the amount of wordplay uh, right, right. that's in there. So he starts Van Winkle with Macadam, which could well be uh, kind of referencing Adam. So there's all these ideas about e, uh, e, Adam and Eve and Eden, and the extent to which uh, America might be seen as, a, a kind of, in terms of the new world, a kind of Edenic project. Uh, um, so that's that's in there. Um, he's got a number of myths in there, which might also be regarded as sort of uh, big, sort of beginning myths. He's also got, of course, his own beginning. Um, he's got his childhood in in that section of Van Winkle, where he's talking about. Um, you know, the idea about one day in spring my father took to me uh, the whip stripped from the lilac tree or is it the sabbatical unconscious smile my mother almost brought me once from church and once only as I recall it flickered through the snow screen blindly it forsook her in the doorway it was gone before I had left the window it did not return with the kiss in the hall so right in there you've got this uh, this reference to his parents uh, later on he talks about sundered parentage um, it, it, it's a very it's an autobiographical poem as well as being a poem, if you like, kind of about the, the biography of America. Um, and so you have all these these terms about memory and starting and beginning, uh, which again is something that, that crops up again and again. And, and I would just uh, reiterate the river is just an astonishing uh, bit of work. Uh, I think it's the, the one that sort of uh, his friend Malcolm Cowley pointed out as being a, just an amazing piece, even, even very early on when, when the, the book came out. But it, it brings in so much, it brings in so much of the country, it brings in so much about, uh, as Lanny was saying, about movement and this, this kind of extraordinary contrast between modernity and all these modern technologies uh, that are, are appearing around this period or just before, or certainly during Crane's lifetime. Also kind of contrasting, I suppose, with all those beginnings. So you have the, the, the kind of great sense of, of, of optimism, really, uh, of crossing the country speedily uh, of... Um, Still, to an extent, he's, he's involved in pushing west um, uh, through the frontier, uh, but he's also very interested in, well, well how, how do we then, is this a great moment to go back and think about where we've actually come from, and, and, and will that help us think about where we might be going? Yeah, um, I said we were going to inevitably short shift such a long poem. Um, that that segment, uh, the Powhatan's Daughter segment, is, is generally seen as... Uh, the the highlight of the poem even by the biggest detractors of uh the bridge uh, i want to talk uh, about uh, uh some of the later sections uh, two later sections that are not viewed as kindly the first being cuddy sark which even though it's just the third section comes afterwards and it's it's this whole sort of uh you can see sort of crane's advertising background in it i've always thought of it as sort of crane's manic answer to something like after apple picking for frost because he's trying to evoke american voices but the voices there are are so many they can't they can't uh, stay talking about something the 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 speaker of the poem or, or or the recipient of the poem is sort of moving in and out uh in in this sort of fugue of american voices and i think that's one of the reasons i, I would say cuddy sock probably is one of those segments that has often been vilified uh, from what i've read and then also we'll talk about, I guess, maybe three songs, because that's the other multiple 
uh, part poem. But do either of you have a comment on Cuddy Saw? Because that seems to be uh, Crane on, you know, the, his biggest edge there. Oh, I don't know. I, you know, I, I've always found him charming. Uh, and, uh, you know, one of the, you know, as you say, it's a kind of lyric collage that involves a certain amount of advertising play, I suppose. Uh, but uh, Crane was in, in love with uh, reading about the uh, whaling ships uh, and their history and their names. And, uh, and he drops them into his poem, you know, Rainbow, Leander, Taping, Ariel. Uh, it's, a, uh, it, it's a Melvillian section, kind of self-consciously. It begins with an uh, epigraph from Melville. And, uh, it, 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 um, in, in general, Crane was interested in incorporating in the poem some of the history of um, well, you could say imperial conquest and certainly commercial conquest uh, of uh, the continent and indeed the globe that was part of American history, which he understood uh, simultaneously in, uh, well, you could say in ambivalent terms. That is to say, he, uh, he understood that, that this was a history of genocide. He understood that this was a history of um, material exploitation. He also... Uh, saw it uh, as a um, uh, a history that that in its um, in its thrust and intentions uh, in its motives and potential uh, opened up a kind of uh, uh, hope for uh, human creativity that might you know actually redeem the uh, uh, brutal uh, facts of of, um, of that history. Uh, and and the, his poem is really dedicated to that possibility. And this is this is one section. It's incorporating the um, it's incorporating the sea and the history of maritime America. Uh, Neil, what's what are your thoughts? Yeah, no, I, I think that's that's absolutely that's absolutely it. And it's, I think it's interesting that the, the bridge is still there in the background. Um, I, I, in a way, you can. He says at one point, you know, I started walking home across the bridge. Um, so that there's definitely a kind of sense in which he's he's kind of ventriloquizing, um, and that he's. He, I mean, you can, in a way, you know, regard him as showing off some of this. Uh, he, he is, in a way, I think, responding again to to Elliot. He's saying, "Well, you know, Elliot does these things in the wasteland where he has two women talking together in a pub, but look, here I am. I can do this kind of thing as well." Uh, in this is going to dive in South Street. Um, yeah, so he, he's he's both kind of engaging with that history. I think he's talking about kind of literary history as well. Obviously, with reference to Melville, he's acknowledging that. Um, and I, I guess, in a way. He's also doing the sort of things that you might expect to happen, uh, possibly in a uh, in an epic. I mean, maybe you would expect very many different voices to appear in the epic. Maybe you would think about the sea as being a really kind of epic space. Um, so he had a lot of Yeah. Yeah. So so he's uh, so he, he's doing sort of kind of treating those expectations with a, with a degree of skepticism as well, because he, he's adapting them for his own purposes. Um, so I think I think it's actually a, a pretty successful section. Uh, I, I, it's it's sort of Crane at his most experimental in some ways, at least sort of typographically as it appears on the page, uh, which he doesn't do very much. Um, he does it a bit in, in Cape Hatteras, but uh, really this is this is quite a sort of uh, I guess as somebody who reads a lot of Crane, this is interesting in the sense that it's it's unlike quite a lot of the way he presents his work normally. Yeah, K. Paris is another section. It's probably the longest single section of the poem, but that's it's often praised, and it, it involves Whitman, and it's this sort of Whitmanian sweep across uh, across uh, years. Uh, let's just talk then um, about uh, the section three songs, and then the last three sections: Quake Hill, the Tunnel, and Atlantis. And again, we're going to end up short shrifting it, but. Um, I, I know that just critically speaking, uh, three songs has, has never been as praised as much as Powhatan's Daughter, the other section that's divided into uh, smaller sections. Um, so let's talk a, a bit, just a little bit about that and then towards how the poem moves towards its final end. Um, uh, three songs has Southern Cross, National Winter Garden, Virginia. Um, Neil, do you want to just start on that? Sure. A few kind of... So the, 
this this is uh, I guess in a way kind of muses. Uh, he's got these these sort of three women um, in here. Um, it, it, the I mean, the Southern Cross one um, it, it is is interesting in the sense that it, it uh, kind of engages with these religious figures. These kind of um, Eve, Mag Mary Magdalene. Uh, he, he uses this idea of Mary, brings Mary back um, in the Virginia as well. So it, it seems to be a level he's kind of really address, uh, addressing the kind of um, religious dimension of, of America, uh, ideas that America has about um, possibly purity. Uh, because ideas about purity and impurity and corruption um, are things he gets comes right back from white building, so all the way through uh, the bridge as well. Uh, and again, I think you, you think about that in terms of, of kind of modern life and the extent to which he thinks that um, language has become kind of corrupted, um, that the, the people are, are on the cusp of change. Uh, he reads... Um, Oswald Spengler's Decline of the West, for example, and is quite influenced uh, by it, particularly later on when he's running the last stages of the bridge. Um, so in that sense, what place does this kind of a, a, a strong um, female iconography almost uh, have within America? Um, can it be used in order to um, reconstruct a sense of kind of pureness or purity within the country. Uh, I, I guess the most interesting of those three is National Winter Garden. Um, he, what he's doing is obviously he's looking at the burlesque. Uh, a number of critics have kind of written about this. Uh, Gordon Tapper has some really interesting things to say about this section. Um, and this is, a, this is a kind of startling section in some ways. It's quite explicit. Um, in what it in what it deals with in terms of those kind of burlesque shows that were going on uh, that E. Cummings uh, writes about and, and draws pictures of um, quite uh, quite a lot in in the twenties um, and, and it it seems to be again suggesting different facets of character so you could have one version of uh, kind of female character in Southern Cross you can have another in Virginia uh, and yet you can have this quite um, startling um, very uh, kind of Sexually uh, aware of female within uh, within National Winter Garden. Uh, go ahead, Lenny. Uh, nothing to add. Okay. Um, in the last three sections, I always consider that sort of uh, the hard crane version of sort of the ending of 2001 A Space Odyssey, in that you have Crane sort of swooping through time, going underneath, and then coming out in the Atlantis section, sort of bridging past myth with the, the future myth of coming man and technology and whatnot. And I don't know, for some reason, that's always evoked to me the last uh, sort of Stargate sequence at the end of 2001. Um, uh, because it, it is quite a bit there, um, maybe, Lanny, if you could just sort of uh, give us a, a, an overview of Crane through those last three sections where he takes the reader and his relationship to America and 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 and, and man, uh, mythically speaking. Yeah, um, you mentioned Edward Bruner uh, earlier. One interesting feature of his work was to, uh, by studying the manuscripts, expose the fact that the last section, Atlantis, was really the first that Crane worked on, uh, and in that sense, it was uh, the beginning of the poem. Yeah. Uh, and it it offers the kind of transcendental vision of nation and the culture uh, that the whole poem would aspire towards. Uh, the uh, uh, section, interestingly, that was written last was the middle section, which is Cape Hatteras. It's the one that he really struggled with. Uh, really struggled with because at this point he really knows that, that some of the friends that he had initially counted on uh, as uh, embracing the poem and its vision, which depends on a, uh, this whole vision depends on a sense of uh, a community uh, ready to receive it and share in it. Uh, he, he, he's conscious of writing in real isolation, having had uh, 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 fights with uh, Alan Tate and Ivor Winters and others who uh, 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 essentially, uh, you know, uh, condemned the uh, motives and, and scale of the poem, um, and yet he's kind of trying to hold to his vision. And so that's uh, that's the kind of pathos of that that big section, Cape Hatteras, where he's he's turning to uh, Whitman, 
and asking Whitman to grasp his hand, since it doesn't seem like any of his friends will. <laughs> and uh, uh, it's it's uh, it's another poem that, in in this case, is is interested in in both. Well, in 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 evoking American history and its ambivalence, uh, it's guiding motif is flight. Uh, it's about uh, the uh, invention of the airplane and the Wright brothers' first flight. Uh, it also is about aerial warfare in the First World War. Uh, and uh, in that sense, it's a, it's a poem that both you know wants to acknowledge a certain kind of uh, utopian technological promise uh, and uh, yet uh, admit the ways in which it can be used for human destruction uh, and still um, want to uh, hold on to the uh, larger uh, transcendental promise uh, that uh, Crane sees in flight, say. Um, So that's the kind of ideological battle that, that Crane's fighting in that, that poem and, uh, and, that, uh, and that he then colors and carries on uh, in the final sections of the tunnel uh, in Atlantis, uh, the tunnel being a poem about the subway uh, being uh, a kind of infernal narrative uh, and being in certain ways the, the closest to the wasteland. Uh, and and there are various kinds of quotation of Eliot in in that section of the poem. And uh, Eliot, in fact, published the poem in the Criterion, very satisfying to Crane. Uh, And and then Atlantis was meant to, you know, redeem the uh, the tunnel uh, and uh, to a degree uh, redeem the kind of poetics of the wasteland. Crane wanted to kind of include that negative vision and and yet transcend it. Uh, so the kind of ambivalence or ambiguity of, of plight in Cape Hatteras, uh, those dimensions are redistributed again in the tunnel in Atlantis, and again Crane wants to uh, you know uh, uh, affirm the the kind of uh, transcendental promise uh, that he. Uh, he finds in the myth of the bridge. Neil, uh, any comment uh, on you on how the poem ends? Well, I, I think the thing about Atlantis is, is, is as Tony as Lenny says, and the whole point about it is that it's supposed to synthesize. It's, I mean, he, he uses this word constantly. The kind of, I think it's even in the poem, synthesis. He, he wants to bring things together. Uh, and one of, the, I guess, one of the, the fascinating things about the whole poem, Bridge, is, is the extent to which that succeeds or doesn't quite make it. Um, I, I find the last section uh, very powerful. I mean, I think it's really interesting in the way that he um, really starts to engage with the material part of the bridge. I mean, he actually stands there and looks at the Brooklyn Bridge and, and describes it in extraordinary detail uh, in, in what it effectively is a kind of mythical detail. So that opening section of, of Atlantis where he's talking about the bound cable strands, I and mean, you can just imagine it uh, as soon as he starts writing about it, you can see it in your mind, the, the arching path upward, veering with light, the flight of strings, taut miles of shuttling moonlight syncopate, the whispered rush, telepathy of wires. It, it, it's it, it's turning the, the uh, it, it's kind of a frastic version of the bridge, actually. I, mean, I think people have talk, talked about it in those terms as well. He's, he's turning something which is, for many people, just a kind of everyday uh, way of getting from one part of uh, New York to another into something which is much, much grander uh, and has its own kind of powerful narrative, um, which a lot of people have just regarded in terms of, of kind of technological promise, but engineering, ingenuity. But actually, it's it's a wonderful work of art, really, as far as Crane is concerned. And of course, it's not a coincidence that he, he tries to get um, originally Joseph Stella's uh, painting of the bridge, this, this wonderful, colourful, uh, uh, fantastic kind of celebration of the structure. And then he ends up, he doesn't quite manage to, to get that, but he ends up with Walker Evans's uh, sort of superb photographs of, of parts of the bridge as well. And, and they are a kind of wonderful um, versions of the bridge. They're not just, here's a picture of Brooklyn Bridge, but they are bits of it. They might be ships going underneath, or they might be um, something that fits perfectly in the proem at the beginning. It's just sort of the uh, a part underneath 
bridge. He doesn't give you just the bridge. He gives you these angles, these versions of the bridge. And that's very much, in, in a way, what, what this uh, Atlantis seems to be doing, actually. Um, but extending it outwards into something that is, he says, beyond time and having ever-presence. So he kind of regards the, the Brooklyn Bridge as representative of everything he's just been talking about uh, and as something that um, will stand as far as he's concerned, forevermore, as a, a great representation of uh, of these ideals and these visions that he has for uh, the country. It does, but it doesn't end in the way that, say, the wasteland ends with kind of shanty, shanty, shanty. Those references at the end to the peace. It doesn't end with a, a, a kind of conclusion, however kind of inconclusive you might think that is. It doesn't end with a conclusion. It ends with these whispers antiphonal in Azure swing is the last line. So there's a sense in which there's constant movement still going on. Uh, and, and maybe some of that is handing the movement over to you to say, okay, this is still continuing, and it's your job now as the reader to go out there and, uh, and make of America uh, what you will. Well, let's end this segment then. The final segment, I want to talk about the final years of Crane's life, uh, a couple of the keystone poems that came afterwards, and how uh, critics uh, view him now and in the future. We'll do that in a moment. O oh, Carib Isle by Hart Crane, the tarantula rattling at the lily's foot across the feet of the dead, laid in white sand near the coral beach, nor zigzag fiddle crabs side stilting from the path that ship subvert and anagrammatize your name. Know nothing here below the palsy that one eucalyptus lifts in wrinkled shadows mourns. And yet suppose I count these nacreous frames of tropic death, brutal necklaces of shells around each grave squared off so carefully. Then, to the white sand, I may speak a name, fertile, albeit in a stranger tongue, tree names, flower names, deliberate, gainsay death's brittle crypt. Meanwhile, the wind that knots itself in one great death coils and withdraws, so syllables want breath. But where is the captain of this doubloon isle without a turnstile? Who but catchword crabs patrols the dry groins of the underbrush? What man or what is commissioner of mildew? Throughout the ambush senses, his Carib mathematics webbed the eyes baked lenses. Under the Poinciana of a noon or afternoon, let fiery blossoms clot the light, render my ghost sieved upward, white and black along the air, until it meets the blue comedian host. Let not the pilgrim see himself again, for slow evisceration bound like those huge terrapin each daybreak on the wharf, their brine caked eyes spiked overturned such thunder in their strain and clenched beaks coughing for the surge again slagged of the hurricane eye cast within its flow congealed by afternoons here satin and vacant you have given me the shell satan carbonic amulet sea of the sun exploded in the sea Voyageur. Seven twenty one ninety nine to four twenty seven thirty two. O Lord, how manifold are thy works! In wisdom hast thou made them all. The earth is full of thy riches. So is this great and wide sea, wherein are things creeping innumerable, both small and great beasts. There go the ships. There is that Leviathan whom thou hast made to play therein. Psalm one o four, verses twenty four to twenty six. O oh, Harry, thou art not nobler, these long score before this interval. Thy death was not a madness, thy hope, no mere love, disaster, beckons you, brinking on the ecstatic. The brine recalls both great and we, yet the crucifix you planted within, who is only itself, permit me, love, the voyage thou darest not take, the swells thou creepest far beneath, the shadows too fabulous you shrank from my life wrecks in the great wink also you akimbo in the mists arms to the heavens calling you homeward to the love of lives unbroken by the mills the unknowable was what you feared and i have swallowed vast oceans deep within the eyes matrix and i am the agonist joy opportunes my rock is steadfast a continent pulling beneath thee o c o harry Weaned from the wasted, annealed by the grails you constructed in cold alleys, my tin can rolls fragile, metal underbrush to the night, and you, in anime, trace inned the world I clasp my mind, the theatre of your verse, azure, is what binds us time, closes around you, 
me, we a synchrony out of it, and the tides are strong, are wicked. To that coast you stood forever a moment upon the railing, your coat primly folded, the sea stippled with white crests of the future, your life a flutter and near decision, your decision locust on the head of an oblivial pin, generous, understanding, autodidactic and noon, all these were you, are you, in the nights I did not know you, resurrected you, fell into the epic till my birth, evocative of all that since I have weaned. Nobler thou wert, delicate rider of storms unseen, by far in the unknown showers of love, and wrapped by the carillons of wave, I, too, hear their calls. The dumb universe summons you home, serenian and joyous, yet bound to myself, gorge on the mantle below. My earth island moves slowly, all its rivers flow us into you. O oh, love, wink at thyself, wink at the vast overbrims of love I send alone. I am dissubstantiated. No fire hands comfort me. Alone, this threnody weaves too late. The love preserver thou needest, O oh, mariner. Mesmeric of life, your adjustments could not fit. Yet thou play for air within. Thou roarest in mine. It drops like a chaplain tear. As I, quick with despair, tremble on the thought. Noon tolls to Poseidon thou descendest. The last step before the wink. And the tower crumbles to the sea. First denied, but now embraced. O oh, Harry, thou art not nobler. In this final section uh, with uh, Lanny and Neil, I want to talk about uh, the demise of Crane uh, by suicide. Uh, also, uh, the last few poems uh, of note in his uh, his uh, canon, and then also where he's come from in the 80 plus years since his death and where critically he's going, because as we mentioned earlier, Crane now is probably more popular, more read, more referenced in this internet age than he was 30, 40, 50 years ago. Um, let me just start uh, with talking about maybe a final myth that's always uh, sort of bugged me about uh, Crane critics, and that's the idea that after the bridge he was spent. You know, he was a used condom tossed to the side or whatnot. And if you look at some of the, the stuff that he wrote uh, post-bridge, I mean, I don't see any real decline. You have the Key West poems, uh, the most famous one being probably O Carib Island, The Hurricane. Um, you have the, the Oscar Wilde lyric that was uncollected that uh, came out later, C-33. The Broken Tower is the most famous poem and arguably uh, maybe his greatest lyric uh, outside of the bridge. Um, uh, and a handful of other poems. Um, one poem I want to talk about, though, to, to start off, is a very overlooked poem, and uh, that's a poem called Episode of Hands, which if we're talking about queer studies or whatnot, um, this is uh, the closest thing I guess you could get to in his day and age to an overt homosexual lyric, but it's a great it's a great poem because it goes beyond just uh, the typical, you know, uh, uh, I want meat kind of uh, approach to that. Um let me let me ask either of you to speak about episode of hands because I think it is if it even goes beyond just being a love lyric it it, it has I, I think some political elements uh, when it's talking about uh, uh, the gash bleeding the shaft of the sun I mean there are some obvious sexual references there but it seems it seems that we're talking about uh, the interaction it 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 references Whitman Whitmanian sort of. Uh, uh, male friendship, but it, it, it goes beyond anything I think Whitman ever did. Well, it's, uh, I guess it is, it, it's very similar to, to Whitman. Uh, this is very early. I mean, this is 1920. Uh, yeah. He's writing this. Um, and it, it's it, it's very kind of Whitman. You're absolutely right in the sense that, um, you know, he's, when he's talking about um, the the ways in which, um, you, you know, he, he almost references grass, bunches of new green breaking a hard turf. I mean, that sounds like leaves of grass in women's great book. Uh, and it certainly suggests those kinds of um, homoerotic relationships that women sets up in, in a number of those poems, um, leaves of grass. I mean, it, it's, it comes from an actual episode uh, where uh, one of 
his father's employees in the factory was injured uh, with the machinery. Um, and of course, Crane was there, as we were saying earlier, was in the fact did work in the factory for some time um, in the late 1910s, early 20s. So he, he, this is an episode that where he and whether he did this or not, um, is described, at least the, the uh, speaker of the poem is described as bandaging the hands uh, of the person, of the, of the guy, the worker who's been injured. Um, and it, it certainly suggests that there's something interesting here about um, about the technology, about the, the modernity and, uh, and the extent to which it is actually uh, quite a sort of dangerous thing. I mean, it, it, it's is it a critique, for example, of his father and his father's involvement in industry? Um, do they always think about uh, worker safety or are they really more interested in uh, producing as much as they can, uh, as quickly as they can? So there's that element, but there definitely is this element where he's describing uh, at the very end of it when the hand has been bandaged as the bandage knot was tightened the two men smiled into each other's eyes so there's very much a, a there's an instant connection there uh, a bit like you get in, in Faustus and Helen there's a connection between the eyes people uh, or two men look at each other and they, they see each other uh, and they make some kind of connection e even if it's not instantly recognisable as, as being, say, a homoerotic connection. It is certainly a, an intimate one, uh, and that would have been that would have been quite uh, quite a surprising thing for Crane to be writing in um, in the early twenties, and, and that may well be why uh, it wasn't necessarily published uh, in his lifetime. Uh, Broken Tower is is probably even more directly sexual to a certain extent. This is considered, I don't know if it was his actual last poem that he wrote, but it's considered his last uh, poem that I guess might have been published in his lifetime. Was it published in his lifetime? No? It was, uh, he, he sent it for publication. He sent it enough for publication shortly before his death. Uh, so it was his, his last submitted poem, you could say. Okay. Um, published posthumously, yeah, and it's a grand, great poem. Um, it's you know, uh, you know, who among us writes our best poem last? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's pretty impressive performance. Now, this was also at the time when uh, Crane was famously see, supposedly involved with uh, the first woman in his life, and this led to his jumping off. Uh, I guess it was a steamship or a cruise ship uh, in the Caribbean. Uh, let's talk about his demise there. What happened in the last few months uh, of Crane's life that uh, uh, led up to his uh, killing himself? Well, there, there, there are lots of factors. Uh, Crane's father had died. I think that was a significant loss. Uh, Crane's alcoholism was... Uh, had intensified from an already desperate state. Uh, he had had a uh, Guggenheim Fellowship, which he took in Mexico City. He was returning to the U.S. Uh, at the height of the Great Depression. Um, he uh, he had he had not written the the poem uh, that he had gone to Mexico to write. In fact, he'd written very little. I mean, he had been pretty pleased to come away with the broken tower, but he hadn't written much else. Uh, and so I think he had a sense of having wasted his opportunity. Um, I think um, there's, a, there's a certain, you know, uh, sense of, of, of shame that was uh, uh, attached to that. Uh, compounded by his drunkenness and um, in the night before he, he dies he's uh, beaten by uh, sailors on board the uh, ship he's traveling with uh, uh, Piggy Cowley in and uh, he he uh, I, I, you know, I, I think you have to to uh, see him as, uh, you know, a, a man who's just uh, probably, you know, suffered some homophobic violence uh, and uh, has been robbed. He, uh, his last words to Peggy Cowley are, uh, "I'm not going to make it, dear. I'm, I'm utterly disgraced." Uh, 
and it should be stated that that was the wife of Malcolm Cowley, uh, an academic and writer of, of the same period. So, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, Cowley was, a, was an editor in New York uh, and a poet uh, and friend of Crane's. So, uh, at any rate, uh, you know, a lot of factors converge. Uh, and I think, uh, uh, you know, you, you can't really attribute a particular cause. Uh, and, and yet it's, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a kind of, uh, well, I, I'm sure his death was a... Was a uh, Impulsive uh, and uh, in that sense, almost accidental event. Although he he very deliberately uh, threw himself from the ship. Uh, Neil, let me just ask you. We talked a bit earlier about the legacy critically of Crane and uh, how it uh, waxed uh, in his life and uh, waned in his life, and after his life, it sort of he was sort of sort of. I mean, I don't think he was even in major anthologies for 30 or 40 years in the middle of 20th century. Now he's sort of rocketed up again. Um, we talked a little bit about why that might be. I'm wondering if you think that uh, the, that part of this, because it may have to do with uh, uh, gay rights and gay uh, trying to position Crane as a gay poet, if that somehow does a disservice to Crane uh, be, uh, to ghettoize him as that. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, I, I think no. Uh, I, I think he's he's appreciated as because it, I mean you're right in the sense that these things go in waves. So uh, when people started thinking about you know, modernist studies, what were they thinking about? Well, a lot of the time, I guess they might be thinking about technology, uh, urban uh, spaces, and, and Crane fits into those kind of things. So he was when he was read and when he was discussed, he'd be talked about perhaps in those terms. Uh, if he's talked about in terms of gender and sexuality, that might be now. He might be talked about in, in different terms in 20 years time. Um, he, he is somebody who, as we intimated earlier, is somebody who can kind of fit into all these points of discussion, uh, that he can be embraced by um, all kinds of people uh, internationally. I mean, he, his, his influence goes beyond America, clearly he goes into into Europe, but it also goes uh, beyond into, say, Russia, for example. Uh, I mean, he's, he's somebody who um, it does mean different things to a lot of different people. Um, and I think part of that comes down to, um, even if you're kind of getting it even in translation, it, it ultimately, I suppose, a lot of it does come down to the, the kind of pyrotechnics of the language and, and the extent to which here is this, this extraordinary ambition uh, of a guy who uh, had all kinds of difficulties that he managed to, in some respects, overcome and some respects not. Um, and, and yet he becomes this, this great kind of, uh, he really is a kind of, he should be a great cultural figure, and yet he has been neglected. Um, so there's always a sense in that in that way that people want to recover him, that they want to kind of bring him back. Um, and I don't know how many times that has happened, but it, it, it's the sort of thing that uh, people feel kind of compelled to do. They feel personally connected to him in that respect as well, I think. Elani, you yes. wanted to say something? I think uh, Neil just said it very well. Okay. Um, let me ask a final question, and then I, I'll ask you both for any closing remarks. Um what do you both think has been the biggest misperception or misconception about Crane, his life, his work? Um, for me, I'll, I'll just posit, I think uh, I've always said to young writers that writing is the highest of the general art forms because it's the most abstract short of having psychic abilities. Um, it's just it's just little scribbles against the background. It, it lacks it lacks the immediacy of the visual arts or 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 uh, dancing or the that you know that uh, the bodily senses and because it is the 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 most abstract it's the most difficult uh art to do because in order to get someone to move someone to tears let's say in a poem you can't just have you you, you just can't have a film where you have a weeping child and you have a crescendo of music uh, and i think that crane along with sylvia plath i would argue that they were the two greatest published language poets in the 20th century in terms of their ability to just turn on a dime. They could manipulate uh, the mind and the emotions of a, a reader of their poems like no one else could. Totally different outlooks on life, but those those were the two, and I think Crane especially 
has been slighted in that regard. So let me just ask finally, uh, let me start with Lanny and then Neil, uh, what do you think has been the biz- biggest misperception about Crane either personally or in his writing? history of this perception. <laughs> yeah, so it's a little hard to start to untangle it. Uh, I guess one thing I would say is, uh, well, you mentioned Plath. Uh, both writers have been read through their biography. Yeah. And I think you could say that uh, while their biography is central, uh, and I would, I would read them both through their biography too, one needs to have a pretty subtle sense of biography and the ways in which life might uh, uh, inflect and uh, uh, impinge on, on a work of art. And um, uh, so I, I would say, you know, just in, in, a, in a nutshell, that Crane's been read in reductive biographical ways and uh, he needs to be read in very subtle biographical ways. How about you, Neil? What's, what's the biggest misperception that you uh, divine about uh, Crane, either personally or literarily? There's also this, this uh, it's frequently been this attempt to call him a visionary, uh, kind of like Rambo or, or somebody who has this sense of uh, kind of a, um, yeah, a, different, a different understanding of the world, but not necessarily, perhaps in the ways we've talked about it earlier, but just as somebody who's not smart, as somebody who just is, uh, as this kind of mystic quality, uh, which he has access to and he's kind of giving us access to, but it just means he has no intellect. And I think that's nonsense. Uh, and I think you you read his letters, uh, and you see what a what a actually a brilliant mind he has. And he he is self educated. He okay. He may not really properly finish school, but he, he goes out there and he reads everything. Absolutely everything. He reads more, I think, than uh, a lot of his contemporaries, a lot of his friends. He reads everything that's coming out of the little magazines. He reads every issue. He talks to people. He deliberately makes connections with people uh, from many different disciplines. So it's a bit like you were saying earlier, uh, Dan, in the sense that he brings together all the arts. And if you think again about you know, the way in which he uses visual art, the way in which he uses cinema, uh, the way in which he uses uh, engineering even, he, he reads all of this. Uh, and then he tries to put it into the poetry. And it's not, a, it's not just throwing in the old word. He says that very directly. That does not represent modern life. You just throw it in. It's what he, he kind of calls retinal registration. It's just a matter of kind of seeing it on the page. And that's all, all, all it does for you. In fact, it's a much deeper engagement with the world around him. Uh, and he, he just isn't given enough credit for that, I don't think. Lanny, any final thought about Crane for any uh, viewers? Well, I think uh, Dan just said something important. I mean, uh, that, that Neil did, and uh, I, I guess I would just underline that that uh, Crane is an intellectual, uh, and and he was a thinker, uh, and that's that's crucial. Neil, your final thoughts for any viewers out there who are just coming to Crane? I think just read it. Uh, it's, it's, it's as simple as that. I, if you want to pick up, uh, that it was a really good thing you picked up episode of Hands. I think that's a great poem to actually think about beginning uh, looking at Crane because it, it, it does deal with quite a lot of the things we've been talking about. Uh, it, it, it's a young person's poem in some ways. Um, I think, it, and, and if you start with that and then you pick out perhaps some of the poems from, from White Buildings, but uh, you just read the bridge from cover to cover. You read the whole thing because uh, it, it's such an experience to read it uh, and to see that great um, kind of swathe of, of American experience that he's trying to pack in there. It, it's just a, a, it is a unique experience, I think, in, in modern poetry. Well, if any viewers have enjoyed the conversation with Lanny and Neil about Hart Crane, you can look below this video. You'll see links to, to them, especially to Neil's Hart Crane Society. Uh, just let me just ask you, is there... When we talk about a society, is the society, is this something where like people have to pay annual dues or is there like a meeting where you meet up once a year or what? what? Usually it happens at the American Literature Association. I mean, that's kind of, that's an academic conference, but I mean, we're, we're open to anybody joining. There are no fees. Um, there will be uh, at some point, there is a Facebook page, there's a Twitter account, um, but there, at some point there will be a sort of newsletter. So uh, you can easily get hold of us via the Facebook page or just by emailing me and I'll put you on the list. Okay, well, again, thank you. Next week, uh, I'll be talking with some experts on another American icon, painter Winslow Homer, and we'll be doing that next week. So, again, I want to thank Lanny and Neil for your insights. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. The Broken Tower by Hart Crane The bell rope that gathers God at dawn 
dispatches me as though I drop down the knell of a spent day to wander the cathedral lawn from pit to crucifix, feet chill on steps from hell. Have you not heard? Have you not seen that core of shadows in the tower whose shoulders sway antiphonal carillons launched before the stars are caught and hived in the sun's ray? The bells, I say, the bells break down their tower and swing I know not where, their tongues engraved membrane through marrow, my long scattered score of broken intervals, and I, their sexton slave, oval and cyclicals and canyons heaping, the impasse high with choir, banked voices slain, pagodas, campaniles with revelries outleaping, oh, terraced echoes prostrate on the plain. And so it was I entered the broken world, to trace the visionary company of love its voice, an instant in the wind, I know not whither hurled, but not for long to hold each desperate choice, my world I poured, but was it cognate scored of that tribunal monarch of the air, whose thighs and bronzes earth strikes crystal word in wounds, pledges, once to hope, cleft to despair? The steep encroachments of my blood left me, no answer. Could blood hold such a lofty tower as flings the question true, or is it she whose sweet mortality stirs latent power? and through whose pulse I hear counting the strokes, my veins recall and add, revived and sure, the angelus of wars, my chest evokes, what I hold healed, original now, and pure, and builds within a tower that is not stone, not stone can jacket heaven, but slip of pebbles, visible wings of silence sown in azure circles, widening as they dip, the matrix of the heart lift down the eyes that shrines the quiet lake and swells the tower, the commodious tall decorum of that sky unseals her earth and lifts love in its shower.